Hello, here we are. I just wondered if that was going to happen and did right on time. Hello, everyone. Welcome to day three of the NHSR conference. I'm uh, Chris Bealey. If For those who don't know me, I'm uh, a data scientist at Nottingham Healthcare NHS Trust, and I am also the uh, co-chair of the technical advisory group of NHSR. And I'll be chairing the proceedings for this morning. So our first speaker today is Gary Hudson, a senior data scientist with Ascent, who will be talking about NHSR solutions. Take it away, please, Gary. Thanks, Chris. Um, just let me share my screen just before we get launched into it. So can everyone see my screen? Yep. Cool. OK. So my name is Gary Hudson. I'm an NHSR fellow. Like I said, I've been with the NHSR community for quite a long time. Worked in various positions in NHS. Used to be a principal analyst at Nottingham. Worked as a head of advanced analytics at Odden and Gem Commission Support Unit as well as uh, other things for my sins. And now I'm a senior data scientist and I work for a company called Mango Solutions. So I'm gonna to talk to you today about NHSR solutions. So as part of the NHSR community's aim to support the learning development, application and exploitation of R in the NHS, what we try and do is provide funding to what we term solutions. And this has, doesn't necessarily have to be packages, it can be training offerings, it can be Python packages that you might want to propose. And we'll look into that in greater depth in the following slides. So what have we got currently out there in the package uh, universe or Cranverse, should we say? So we've got the NHS Data Dictionary package, which has been completed. Essentially, the it's what it does is it scrapes common NHS lockups and it allows you to perform custom web scraping of websites. I've done a workshop on this, so refer to the recordings on YouTube when they're available. We've got the Funnel Plot R package created by Chris Maney. It's a funnel plot package with standard interface to generate funnel plots. I'll give you an example of that in focus on the slide following this one. We've got the Shiny Ender Miner tool, which is a work in progress. Um, it's a Shiny tool to interface with the Ender Miner R package with the aim to extract as much information as possible from semi structured endoscopy reports. We've got the, the awesome patient feedback NHS text classification tool, which is a machine learning text classification project to deal with patient notes. And we've got the PHMS methods R package, as well as the new NHS plot the dots package and the NHS R data sets, which I failed to capture on this slide. So solutions in focus then. So we've got the NHS data dictionary. It was commissioned by the NHSR community in the late 2020 when I was working at Auden and Jam Commission Support Unit. I worked on this with um, another member of the team. It provides functionality to perform web scraping and retrieve NHS lookups with ease. The good thing about the fact that it's a web scraping tool is means that it's always up to date and it's always current because it's always sourcing the most recent lookups from the NHSR community from the NHS Data Dictionary website. And like I've mentioned previously, it's recently part of the NHSR workshop to show how to use the tool. So you can refer to the workshop um, section on YouTube. We also did a web webinar about it back in early this year. So that was also on YouTube. Check it out. So we've got the, the funnel plot R package as well. And all these packages, if you click on the, the slides, it takes you to the GitHub repos that support each one of the packages in the aim of open source and sharing code. So you can have a look to see how they've been constructed. So the funnel plot R package is, does what it says. It allows you to create funnel plots to look at over dispersion, plots things like mortality rates, et cetera, or this example, length of stay. But it's, I, it's turned work in progress on our website, but I think it's more or less there in my, my mind, but Chris Maney might have another view. So, then going to another solution that we've, we've currently developed is Shiny Endomire, which is a work in progress. It's a Shiny tool as a wrapper for the um, Endominer package. And these are a couple of the initial views that I've managed to source from Chris Beely's team. Chris is predominantly working on this. Again, the GitHub will take you to the supporting code repo. So you can have a look to see uh, you know, what he's currently doing on that and his team. As well as that, Chris's team has been really busy this year. Um, they've also been working on the PX text miner package, which, and again, I will touch on this, was an originally a Python package. So it was funding for a Python package. 
put through the NHSR community. So we did fund this project. And then they've created a NHS or they've created an R wrapper to wrap around that Python package. So you can use it in R. Currently now it's been deployed in Shiny as a dashboard. And what it does is it applies machine learning, natural language processing classification. And as you can see on the right, there's a couple of different classifiers based on accuracy and um, the best Matthews correlation coefficient, which means the predictions and the labels matching the actual um, matching the actual classification labels themselves from an NLP perspective. And then you've got a confusion matrix on the left. So yeah, it's, it looks a really good tool. And Chris is still looking for, <clears throat> apologies, people to test this tool. So please get in touch with them if you're interested in perhaps having a look and testing it. As we saw earlier in the conference, and I'm probably gonna just play to that. This is one of the visuals out the back of the NHSR plot the dots package. And this was created by a group of analysts that assembled together and data scientists to say, let's um, recreate the plot the dots methodology into a package. As Simon uh, detailed in day two, it was essentially a, an Excel spreadsheet initially that was distributed around. And I think in his words, he used the term clunky, quite clunky. So they wanted a way to um, perhaps create it with a more streamlined process. So the NHS our plot the dots package was born. And again, this is one of the visuals at the back of it. And you can find the code on the GitHub repository. <clears throat> Pardon me. So how do you apply to build a package or create a solution? So like, as I said before, it's not just packages that you can apply for. We, we use the term solution now, so it could be all Python packages. But solutions do not need to be packages. There can be training offerings as well. So we've conducted some solutions where they've been put through as NHSR solutions and been given funding. So things like Shiny training, Markdown training, or any of the ideas that you've got around training offerings that we could provide. You can basically fill out this pro forma on the right-hand side and put that offering to us. And we're happy to receive preliminary inquiries and support the development of ideas. So essentially the people that who identify these potential solutions, they don't have to be the same people that address the particular solution. And by address, I mean the ones that actually create it. So the first step is actually identifying that there is a need for a solution and then we can provide support. And I'll leave that to one of the slides at the end but we can provide support in terms of, you know, the internal central energy solar team offering support and advice there. So what do we ask from you when filling out the solution pro forma? It's not too in depth, it's quite a simple process. So what we ask when you put the solution together is please write a blog on the NHSR community website, register on a, a, a device called HexiTime, so a company called HexiTime, John Lodge following me will talk about HexaTime and its uses after that, so I won't rain on his parade. But essentially, yeah, register on HexaTime is one of the prerequisites. Run a webinar, present at a conference, or organize a workshop around your package uh, dissemination. Uh, join the NHS or Slack channel um, and be like the technical support for the package. It's really fun. I know that from creating a package it's fun to be able to answer technical inquiries. And when you get your first stack overflow comment, then that's really cool as well. Okay. So what do you want to put in this proposal then? So simple things like name, organization, your title, and a basic summary of the proposal. And then we ask why you think it's a good candidate for an R package. So while the package is out there already, does it meet an unmet need? Does it need to be converted into a package, et cetera? Or a, I put NHSR funded package, but it could be, is, is the, tra is the tra a gap in the training requirements or is there a Python package that doesn't exist out there as well? What would be required to develop the solution to be released on Crown? And if we're talking about Python, then it's um, a PyPy repository as well. Solutions released with open code. So make sure that the code's open and shareable. So posted on GitHub normally is the way that we do it on Git. And an appropriate license is chosen, which doesn't inhibit the sharing of that code and the usage of that code for other applications. 
are two really key components of that. And, you know, I've got Chris on my shoulder saying, make sure it's open, make sure we've got an, an appropriate license. So this line's been added in by Chris, really. And, you know, all the open source nature of what we try and deliver. Work estimate and days to develop solutions. So this is historically been capped at 15 days. Um, but again, that could be put as part of the proposal and we'll assess it at that point. And then the dependencies you need to deliver the package or resource or training, such as people, resources, skill sets, expertise, et cetera. So I'd like to say this is probably the most simple process that you've ever seen. Um, and essentially we've tried to keep it as simple as possible to get the pack packages or solutions approved. So essentially you submit that pro forma that was identified on the previous uh, slides. The technical advisory group essentially votes on it. So we'll give it a, a rank score and say, yeah, it's, it's good. It's a good solution. And then if the package is good or the solution's good, we'll then send a notification out to the person to say, okay, looks reasonable. Um, here's the steps that you need to take to get started. If we, we want more clarity on that, it might loop around from the notification sent to the technical advisory group again, we might ask for more detail around why the package is needed. So just to digress, this is specifically for all solutions, but we've also got a way, I've written a blog post around this. It's actually linked underneath uh, one of these, if you click on that, how we track our solutions currently. So this is by no means the only way that we do it, but we wanna know how popular the packages are that we create. So this is an example of the NHS data dictionary and funnel, funnel plot packages. I don't want to make the chart too busy because we're starting to rack up quite a few packages now. But so uh, it gives you a, an idea of how many times it's been downloaded from CRAN over each month. And it will give you the, so there's a DL stats package. It will give you the status. It will give you this plot as an output. And then it will give you a sum of the number of downloads and times it's been downloaded. And then you can just call the function at the bottom and pass as many packages in that you want to lock up as possible. So that's the way that we, we do it and we just track that over time. And again, we've had some really good workshops this conference, day two specifically around package creation and how you get started in creating all packages specifically. Um, without a doubt, the best package reference has got to be Hadley Wickham's book. Um, I've linked it there. They're all free and open sourced. Hadley's book takes you through all the steps you need to get a package uh, CRAN ready, so to speak. Why and how to build an R package is a good one. Chris Maney did a webinar back for the NHSR community a while ago, um, and that's still really current. It's still you know a really good insight into package development. So yeah, check that one out as well. Building R packages is another good resource that I found and worked with. So that's a book down project. And then if you need any help, so in any internal mentorship, come along and ask the team on Slack to contribute. This is kind of how the energy saw plot the dots package, energy saw data sets packages arose. And I've also had similar conversations around the NHS data dictionary package with someone that didn't work for the NHS, but wanted to develop and found some really good ideas for the package, good functions. So we, we did that all via Git and Stack Overflow. So yeah, the building a community of practice is, is essential. So this is thanks to Zoe, who's put these um, kind of these points together for me. So training as a solution then, so this concept of we're not just trying to aim for NHSR packages and Python packages. We also wanna try and offer training as solutions as well. So just to give you a bit of a roadmap of where this has come from, Training started when the NHSR community started in 2018. Uh, we had the first introduction to R&R &R Studio courses. That was a three-day workshop and was delivered in person. Obviously, you know, certain restrictions have uh, limited that. And then we passed this course on to a train the trainer approach around the community to train people in other areas. And then for the with the aim for them to then train other people. So, you know, try to keep training on and passing on the knowledge. The course has now been developed from PDF slides to be more accessible and version controlled using Sheringham slides. Again, if you 
want to know how to create Sherringham Shines, I'll just digress a second. Sylvia, Sylvia Canelan did a great talk at the last year's conference. Uh, there's a two day workshop around how you can create Sherringham slides. So we've then disseminated that data out into all base packages with, with training. And it's hosted on GitHub as well, so people can share the slides, etc. Two minutes, Gary. Okay, I'll rush through it. <laughs> so the future of the training provision uh, with the development of a our studio course into a package called NHSR training, which can complement, reinforce and standalone to the delivery training. We also have Shiny training developed and delivered to the community. And finally, our Markdown workshop was developed at and first delivered at this year's conference. So both Shine and our Markdown are hoped to be delivered by other members of the community among the train the trainer type workshop approaches. Again, training is integral to what we do. We try and share our knowledge as much as possible. So if you've got a good idea for training or you want to you know, run a webinar or whatever, just get in touch with the central NHSR team. So coming on to the NHSR package and solution mentorship. So a couple of ideas around if you've not got the skills in-house or you've not got the capacity to develop a package, then come to the central NHSR team or register a request on HexiTime and ask for some support. That's essentially how those packages arose that we've seen throughout this conference on days two and, and today. And again, join the R Solutions Club. So I like to coin this as the best solutions are often simple yet unexpected and created by passionate and devoted R aficionados. So there's my little soundbite to close the presentation. But if you've got a good solution, get in touch and we'll see if we can help. So I'll stop sharing now, Chris. Cool, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure I understand how the video works, doesn't matter. I, mu I must say, we haven't got time for questions. I must say though, you're not the only person in the world that imagines me sitting on their shoulder when they're making a decision about their life. And I'm very happy to hear that. I'm happy to be the conscience of the NHS. Anyway, without further ado, let's move on to the next speaker, which is John Lodge, uh, Head of Quality Improvement and uh, co-founder of Hexatime. And he'll be talking about Hexatime, which is a skill exchange and time bank for improving health and care services. Thank you, John. Hi, everybody. Uh, th thanks. Thanks for that. So, so yeah, so I've got uh, two, two jobs at the moment, and um, that's indicative of how Hexatime is run by NHS staff. So... We're a social enterprise. We we sit outside the NHS, but we're we're designed and run by NHS staff. And what Hexitime is is it's a it's a time bank and a skill exchange. And so it's as a time bank, it's a it's a digital platform where people exchange their skills and their expertise using a tokenized time currency. And it's done so on the basis that one hour equals one credit. We've been around for a couple of years and we've we've had a partnership with the NHSR community for just over a year now. And we've had some really, really fantastic engagement with uh, with you guys. And so it's a really good opportunity here just to refresh everyone's memory, introduce a few new people to what can be done with Hexi time and, uh, and, and help help the community to do the really fantastic work it does. So I'll, I'll, I'll give you a bit of a demo. Uh, in a second, I'll do a screen share, show you some functionality and, and then leave some some minutes for Q&A at the end. Do feel free to put questions in the chat and I'm just putting a link to the website in the chat now and I'll, I'll leave my contact details with people if they want to follow up. So uh, what we wanted to do when we, we set Hexi Time up was a, was a couple of things. We wanted to create a marketplace where people could ask for help and offer help. But we also wanted a marketplace that would reward people as they help so that they were incentivized to do so. And, and critically, in, in the NHS, we wanted to make sure that people were getting reimbursed with their time so that you weren't just helping. Helping didn't just become the, the sort of the sport of the, of the privileged with, with the time to do so. so. So that's where the time banking came in. Um, and... And, and core to what we do is trying to have an asset-based approach with people where they can understand their talents, skill sets, their local challenges and their ideas beyond their job title. One of the problems with a job title is it really pigeonholes individuals. And indeed, many people don't necessarily have a job. 
doesn't mean they don't have lots of skills and talents. So we want people to be able to be empowered to identify the specific skill and talent they want to share with the community and to be able to do so. So uh, let's let's show you around a little bit and hopefully you'll recognize some faces on HexiTime uh, from the community. So screen share. Here's the homepage. Uh, it's publicly accessible. You, you don't need to log in to, to view the homepage and to have a look around. It, it essentially asks you to create a profile when you want to participate. But viewing, viewing is simple. Uh, as I scroll down, you'll see something called campaigns, which are protected spaces for time sharing. Uh, you'll see a search feature and you'll see people offering their time and you'll see people requesting time from other people. It's all about improving health and care services. It's not exclusive to NHSR. You'll find a community of communities. And indeed, we can already see uh, people in the audience today have actually started to upload offers in the, in the last couple of minutes. So when you see something that you, you like, so let's see, uh, I can see Rich here has just uploaded something. Uh, if I click on that offer, you'll see a little bit of a blurb about what's going on uh, and I can take up this offer. So I click on that and say, yes, please. I'll, I'll take two hours of your time. I drop him a message. When I hit submit, that'll then follow through into a confidential inbox and linked to the inbox, as you'd expect, people have profiles. So I've just filtered the community here to show people uh, in the NHSR community. And if you look closely on some of these members, you'll see an NHSR community badge like Hansel here. And all of these people have got NHSR badges on their profile. Uh, so when you, if, if and when you do join HexiTime, I'd really encourage you to identify with an NHSR badge. Uh, uh, it really helps us to understand how active the community is and, and, and how people are sharing their, their expertise. And it also allows you to find your NHSR colleagues within the community of communities. So, as I was saying, we, we, we click on Rich's offer, we, we drop him his line and say, yes, please. It then goes into the messaging system. And essentially what then happens is you go into a free step process. So here's an example of when I recruited a team to the London Nightingale Hospital. Step one is you make contact and you say hello through the messaging system. Step two, you then make sure that the exchange is relevant and appropriate. It might be at this stage that you might say, oh, well, actually this, this idea is so golden, I want you to sign a non-disclosure agreement before we proceed or you might need a DBS check, or you might just need to double check a qualification before you proceed with the exchange. You then conduct the exchange. It can either be online or in person. And then you uh, are in a position to exchange the credits. And once you've exchanged the credits, you can repeat the exchange as, as many times as you wish. Uh, so on HexiTime, we've got quite a lot of people from the NHSR community sharing their expertise. I'll, I'll just show you a few examples now. So here's Martine uh, offering to help you with your R programming. You can see here that she's made 10, offer, 10 hours of help. And uh, there's a bit of information about it. You'll see various search tags that are quite important if you, if you play around on the site. Search tags are really critical to finding what you need when you need it. And you'll also notice um, that pictures just make the, the activities a bit more engaging. Here we've, got, um, here we've got an offer around getting started with Power BI and R uh, programming languages. And you can see here again, um, uh, you, you're in control of how much you offer. So in this case, uh, it's just one hour being offered. It might be that that's that's, that's all you've got to be able to offer the community. So we put you in control. Uh, and here's another one. Um, this is slightly different, actually. This is what we call a challenge feature. And this allows people to just sort of raise an idea. So, so here, Mohammed has, has put an idea around, around getting uh, analysts together to provide our training. And essentially, it provides a chat thread where people can then uh, 
make a comment and build comments onto onto the chat thread. And, and ultimately, if that chat thread turns into an exchange, you can then put it onto the time bank, support the idea, and uh, and receive time credits for what you're doing. Um, I just put this one up because it's got Chris on it. Uh, you can see here that uh, Chris is offering uh, mentoring. He's he's made nine hours of of uh, of, of time available, and he's already had three people take him up on that offer. Now, what's going on behind the scenes is we're we're able to understand and map your community. So uh, here's a here's an up to date version of what the NHSR community is doing on Hexi Time, and you can see here that we can we could we could very quickly identify who is exchanging with who, over what subjects, how often. And we can start to get a feel for how time capacity is flowing through a system. You'll also see that there's red and blue uh, on, on the screen. What the, what the blue denotes are people in the NHSR community sharing with their own community. And what the red is showing are how people are either offering their skills outside the NHSR community or drawing skills from outside the community into NHSR. So a really good example here uh, with, with Chris and Suzanne. So uh, Suzanne is providing support around literature reviews, and that's a resource that's not necessarily in the NHSR community. And Chris has drawn that resource into the community. Um, equally, you'll see examples where people, uh, people in the community are helping in the other direction. So uh, Lynn here, uh, 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 sorry, sorry. Um, uh, Sam here, taking resource from 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 Lynn. So we can also start to see who the big players are that are like really dynamic in the community. We can start to see people that are really embedded in multiple communities, like Daniela here is kind of one foot in the NHSR, one foot out, but a real a real linker. So we can we can start to provide intelligence around the community when it's when it's being mapped through hexi time about needs and wants and where we can support you you better and i'm just going to point you to two more things uh i go back to the home page uh we we have a protected space for the nhsr community if i go to campaigns and scroll through these toggle arrows and i get to one called the nhsr community wishing well when i click on that you'll see that we've got a protected space for people to offer requests and raise challenges uh, a, a, around it. So uh, within here, you can see a bit of explanation about what we're about. And then towards the bottom, you'll see that activities are specifically relevant to the community. And what's quite interesting is you'll see a few randoms like these guys that are not in the NHSR community, but may need the skills of the NHSR community to support other projects. So this one specifically around environmental sustainability. So you could go in and have a browse and, and, and see what's going on there, or you could simply search for activities uh, through the search features as, as well. And you might want to do that uh, by, by community, for example, here with NHSR. Uh, finally, what I'm going to just show you is how to raise a, an activity. Uh, there's a number of ways of doing it, but the simplest way on the home page is to click on this button here that says offer or request support. You're then presented with three options. You can raise a challenge like Mohammed, or you can offer time or request time. Let's say I want to ask for help. Click on that and you're presented with a free step form. Uh, and I'll just show you how that looks. So um, I need help with uh, understanding. You can add a bit of a blurb about your situation. And I'd always say add a picture at this stage because pictures really support engagement and, and trust around, around an activity. You can then do a number of things like you can, this is all about remit. So we can put an expiry date. If you need that help, let's say by, by Christmas, uh, when it expires, it will just drop off the platform so you don't get pestered when you don't want to be. Uh, you can specify a location if you want to 
do it in person by postcode. Uh, you can also add a few logistical things on there. You can, you can also specify availability. So it might just be a one-off or it might be that you need coaching every two weeks and you can put specific times on there for recipients to, to see what you're, what you're requiring. Uh, and then finally, if I go to the third tab, this is all about the search tags so that people can find you. And you can do that by geography. Indeed, you'll see here that HexiTime has become international now and we've got people from around the world joining. Uh, but you can do it by region. Uh, you can do it by provider. Uh, if you work for an organization that, that's not on this list, just drop me a line and I'll, I'll add it to the drop down quickly. Uh, you can also uh, add various skills. So it might be that you want coaching and mentoring, for example. And then really importantly, on the campaign one, whenever you do anything with NHSR, I'd really encourage you to tag their campaign. And by tagging their campaign, it means that it pops up in that in that campaign field for you all to find easily. And then you just hit, simply hit submit. And when you hit submit, that will go live onto onto the marketplace, and you'll be able to exchange with people. Uh, there's a there's a lot more behind Hexi Time. There's private project spaces. Uh, you can you can raise all sorts of different activities, but but that's the meat of it. And um, I'll just make sure I leave plenty of time now for, for Q and A if um, if anybody has any questions. And I, I'm just looking at the chat now for the first time, but I'll pause for a second. And I'm just seeing something a bit about Slack there. So there was a there was a question in there, which is you know it comes up a lot about just basic time capacity. Um, have I got the time and the space to help people? Uh, I'm not I'm not going to say that Hexi Time fixes that, but what it does is it helps. So whenever you help somebody on Hexi Time, you get reimbursed with time credits, one hour for 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 every uh, one credit for every hour that you help. And of course, what that's allowing you to do is almost pay it forward. So with those credits, you, you're, you're then equipped for next time you need to do something to bring in other people's time and expertise. You can set up a profile as a person or indeed a department or a team or, or a hospital uh, as well. And so you can move credits between people and organizational entities as well. So that also means that people who are snowed under can be supported by people with time by moving their capacity through an organizational entity. Uh, you can simply donate credits to, to members as well uh, and just pass them, pass, pass them around. Um, and so, and so what, we're, what we're making sure is that you get rewarded for helping people and you can, uh, you can at least get your time back. Just check in the chat. Yeah, Mohammed's point there around uh, crossing boundaries is really important. So we, we designed it to cross professional and organizational boundaries. So I, I wouldn't say there is a typical person on Hexi Time. What's, what's uniting everybody is that they're, they're there to help each other to, to improve health and care services. So there are, there are lots of people uh, from NHSR who are sympathetic to what you do, but there are also people who have got no idea what R is. And, and so there's an opportunity to, to sort of cross-pollinate between networks as well, Ta take resources from other networks and help other people from other networks. Uh, I'll also say we're, we're on Twitter. Uh, if any of you are on that, just stick a handle in the chat. And if anybody's got any questions later on, uh, I'm putting the email in the chat too. John, there is one question about getting free credits when you first sign up. Yeah, so uh, credits are not money. So don't, don't worry about the status of your credits so much. When you, when you spend credits, there's never an obligation for you to earn them back. So 
So you can hypothetically go to minus 10 and you're not going to get the heavies from Hexy time knocking on your door, getting, getting their credits back. But just to smooth the, 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 um, the process, we, whenever you sign up to Hex time, we give you two discretionary credits just to get you, get you more confident and comfortable with spending before you help other people. When we evaluate the platform, it's pretty consistent now. We found that people typically give about four hours, four times more than they take. So for every hour that's taken from next time, about four are donated. So it is really sustainable. And I wouldn't want you to, anyone to worry about just taking. Go on there, get the help you need. One of the other reasons why that works is relationships are often win-win. So even the person helping somebody is, is, is getting a lot from that relationship. It might be that you're contributing to their research. You might be contributing to their professional development. Uh, they might be doing it for the pure joy of charity. Uh, but don't worry about that. There's, there's women relationships. But yes, when, when you sign up, you get two credits to get you, get you started. Great. Thanks. I'll move this on now, John. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> okay. I must say, oh, sorry, did someone say something? <clears throat> no. Um, I must say, I do agree about um, giving being its own reward. I, I often say that if, if basically if I'm bored and you send me an R question, I will almost certainly answer it because it'd be more interesting than what I'm currently doing. So I think that's and that's a big part of our whole community, I think, is that we like to uh, we like to have um, interesting problems to look at. Right. With, without further ado, uh, our next speaker is uh, Suki Panasar, who's a deputy director, and he'll be talking to us about Analyst X. Suki, please. Chris, thank you very much for that. And uh, hello, everyone. Um, let me just get my slides on. Give me a second. They are coming, sorry. IT sometimes gets the better of us. I'm assuming folk can see my screen. Chris, say yes. Uh, yes, yeah, sorry, I can't see anything. No, so, not yet. Not no. Yet, Suki. So no. I feel okay, like there might try. be some technical problems on the Zoom, to be honest, because the whole screen is blank. I don't know if our colleagues can assist. Oh, there it okay, is. Well, sorry, now. panic over. Carry on. There we go. All right, then, let's make a start then. So um, thank you very much to the R community for inviting me to um, what I've been following on the, the Twitterverse and then LinkedIn world as, as a fantastic conference so far. Um, and, and it's very hard to you know, speak after John from Hexy Time, who gives such a wonderful account of, of, of his initiative. Um, John might be surprised I'm going to talk a little bit about Hexy Time in mine as well. So with, without further ado, um, for those of you who don't know me, I, I'm Suki. Uh, I lead on strategy and development within the data and analytics teams in NHS England and Improvement. Um, and, and, and Mohammed very kindly invited me to talk a little bit about uh, our story of Analyst X. And when I use the word our, uh, I, I don't mean NHS England or Improvement. I basically mean that the wider data and analytics community uh, that's been responsible for setting up Analyst X. Um, now, the, the reason I have actually got this slide on is um, many of you know that at some point I do fancy uh, writing a book of some sort. I think I've nailed the cover quite well, what I think that'll look like. I think I've got the title right as well. Um, but, but there are a few key points I'd like to make on this slide, which is I think there, there are very few of us uh, who, who imagined that, that the pandemic uh, would, would probably take uh, such a huge physical, emotional, mental toll, not, not just for patients, citizens, but, but, but even staff and ourselves. And then we've all been impacted in some way. And, and, and then the impact has been quite profound. And I think that the pandemic has actually reminded us that, that no health system was actually built or, or designed to cope with pandemics or what we're going to see going forward. Um, and, and it almost felt as if we, we, we were trying to build a new healthcare system 
Um, and that's that's been accelerated by COVID and COVID has reminded us we need to do that. But, but it almost felt for those of us who have been in the eye of the storm, um, and then I say the eye of the storm for the data and analytics community as well, because never before has there been such a strong need, desire and want for data and analytics and in fact insights to help shape decision making that at times it's felt really hard. It's felt as if everything is falling down. And then that's the point I make around the dominoes. But but I think out of that, there have been a couple of good things, uh, as few as they may be, that, that have emerged. And I'd like to think one of the good things that has come about is, is, is not just an uh, analyst X, but it's, it's more the idea that we need to collaborate, we need to work across organizational boundaries. And, and analyst X is, you know, trying to do that, to, not by itself, but together with a whole host of partners, actually, uh, to, to make that happen. Now, Analyst X for us actually uh, started very much as what one would describe as a skunkworks type project. Uh, and I vividly remember the mid uh, month in March when we were told we were all going to be working from home in NHS England. And essentially what we wanted to try and do for 50 of our analysts, no more than that internally, was just provide a safe space uh, using the technologies we have, and they're not perfect, um, to essentially prevent the duplication of dashboards uh, that, that that happens quite a lot of the time but but also you know the stuff that the R community talks about a lot around openness sharing code methodologies and then that was certainly an aspiration and we said if we could get 50 of our really talented and bright analysts just to ta- start sharing having those useful conversations then we might be onto a winner here I think what surprised us with what is now known as Analyst X, and for those of you who joined in March, you will recall it was called the COVID-19 Data and Analytics Community, um, was literally within two weeks, we had about 200 people sign up. And then month on month, we had about 800 to 1,000 people sign up. And, and I think that this humbled us quite a lot, but but also reminded us that actually there is a need for communities of practice. Uh, the PyCon community, the R community, Analyst X, and, and perhaps this is the new paradigm in which we do need to start working, which is not necessarily about organizational boundaries, but actually about being able to work more in the horizontal uh, as opposed to the vertical top-down fashion that most of us are subject to walking in, to working in, sorry. So again, one of the points I'd like to make to, to the audience here is with, with quite a bit of digital transformation, and you might find this funny coming from a strategist, it's not as if everything has been designed to the nth degree from the start, uh, and we have a clearly articulated strategy. And in fact, our, our vision, mission, and values, um, and in fact, the strategy document, which is open and freely available for anyone on Analyst X, was actually created in month two or three, when we noticed lots and lots of people were joining. Um, and, and without wanting to boil through the slide, um, essentially the point I want to make is we in Analyst X, together with our partners, w- w- want to essentially provide a space where people can connect and feel empowered just to do the stuff that most of us as analysts are going to do, which is re- really provide some useful insights that are g- actually going to impact the front line, be it the clinician, be it patients, or, or, or be it citizens. And I think one of the reasons we have probably grown uh, quite quickly um, is everyone who has joined Analyst X is pretty much stuck to our values. And then values are so, so important here. Um, and, and I think that's very important when you're building any community of practice that you have a clear set of values and you don't quite deviate from those. And, and, and I think for us, it has actually been two key values. One is about collaboration. The other one is around trust. Um, and, and, and and, and the last one, I'd probably say that that has had a huge focus is around innovation or constantly wanting to challenge the status quo. Now, again, for, for, for those of you who joined on day one, you would probably look at the workspace. And the workspace, for those of you who are not aware, is essentially a microsite built on this ecosystem known as Future NHS, which is our on, one of our online collaboration platforms. Um, and essentially, it was just a dump of various different assets. But but a t- group of us got together and said, actually, as the user numbers increase, we probably want to have a more standardized look and feel uh, towards the workspace. and 
we said there are probably going to be three ways in which we're going to interact with our audience and our members. And the best example I use here is the British Library analogy, which is you have all, we have five key sections, which are the way your books are actually classified in the library. So we've got the data information analysis, evidence, community networks and learning, and the analytics market exchange. These are essentially repositories based on what it says on the tin. But then we also have discussion forums, which I, I do apologize in advance, are very 1990s uh, technology, uh, as I'm often reminded on Twitter. Uh, but, but we have found them very, very helpful uh, because there have been some really good stories where people have wanted to do stuff and have essentially said, hey, I'm creating X or Y. Is there anyone who can reach out? And literally within an hour, you will have 20 or 30 people uh, piling in, offering ideas, wh what one can do. And in fact, just sharing and saying, do you just want to use mine instead of creating yours from scratch? And I think trying to reduce that duplication is so, so important uh, if we're actually to make meaningful use of the data and analytics capacity we have within health and care. The last one you will probably also all be aware of, th these are the huddles um, and huddling had become a thing uh, in, in the NHS. So we, we ran national huddles, which on a good Friday had about 300, 400 people attend on, on a normal Friday, about 200. And we've developed variants of those around mini huddles. We've got lunch bites now. So, so there's a whole program of activity here around static information and real-time dynamic exchanging ideas. And, and, and basically using the huddles very importantly for us to learn from local systems on what is the really good stuff that is going out there. Because uh, at the end of the day, we need to learn from each other regardless of these false constructs we have created of national, regional, and, and local systems. Uh, it's, it's actually all one thing. We just end up playing in slightly different places. Um, again, very quickly, the data library, uh, the key point I want to make here is, uh, and some of you will be interested in this, we are in NHS England and Improvement getting some of our teams to actually start uh, putting out at least their policy perspectives in the open before they're fully published. So we've got teams such as the Data Alliance Partnership, the Population and Person Insights team. They of course have their internal uh, SharePoint and way of sharing information, but they've also created more a public space for the community to actually start engaging with them. And I think that is very, very important because otherwise it always appears as if things are being created in a black box. A fair few of you actually in our community uh, contribute to the information analysis section. So we've got lots of modeling stuff here, but, but more importantly, we've got the machine, machine learning community of practice, which we have created and then got loads of learning material there, which I think many people do find quite helpful. The evidence section is essentially a yellow pages of all the different evidence resources that exist out there. It initially started just with COVID-19. We're currently trying to work out uh, are we still just going to provide an evidence wrapper, a yellow pages service, or are we going to do a bit more, such as provide one page evidence synthesis on particular topics? So, so more of that for anyone who's interested in learning about that, ping me later. I suppose the most vibrant part we have on Analyst X is the community networks and learning uh, section. And, and I think during the pandemic, it, it's probably emphasized more than ever before, the thirst that people actually have for wanting to learn new stuff and, and not just learn uh, and not apply, but actually learn and be pro provided with the opportunity to apply some of those learnings. So essentially we've created the Analyst Learning Exchange, uh, which is, we basically said, we think there are four or five uh, family groups that uh, data professionals and analysts should be thinking about. These are quite aspirational and more with the 2030 lens. So things such as curator, storyteller. Um, and essentially we've taken a lot of the learning material that exists out there in the various interwebs uh, that are there, uh, Google, YouTube, but also working with our vendors to sort of start pooling together this information that they have in, in an easy accessible uh, micro fashion, you know, bite-sized chunks that people can actually consume. And then we've got the last section here, which is more the R&D innovation space. Um, I think there are a couple of you here who we have actually invited to our podcasts. Um, and then the reason for these podcasts is actually more to inspire uh, our younger colleagues to actually understand what do some of the senior data professionals and analysts do? What is their personal story? And I'd urge some of you to actually listen to these. There's some really interesting nuggets out, uh, out there, things that you might not generally know about these individuals, but which are always quite refreshing to hear. 
Um, and then we've got other stuff that has been mentioned in the data strategy around creating a data and analytics accelerator. There's a huge focus on apprenticeships and creating a data and analytics passport, which is essentially a web-based app for all the different badges of learning, put them in one place so that it's easily accessible for all. If John's still on the call, uh, I think it's only fair to mention, we see Hexi time as also being quite important for some of the stuff that we want to be doing going forward. So, so we've got a community uh, of analysts and we've, we've got a play on the word analyst here. Apologies, it's quite cheesy, but essentially we've got about 100, 150 people. We'd actually like them to time bank some of their time uh, on, on particular endeavors uh, within Hexi time. So more of that in January. Uh, so keep your eyes out for that. In terms of numbers, I, I often talk about these numbers, and I think we we, we certainly at the center have got a bit stunned, uh, 16,000 members. We continuously grow. But the point I'd like to make here is, whereas we're very happy to grow and then hope we that we continue growing, the next phase for us for the next year is actually uh, working with our strategic partners and working with others out there who want to develop micro communities of learning. So what we have said to ourselves is, we've probably created 50% of what we think the community of practice called Analysec should look like. And we want other people to come and tell us what, what other communities do we need to create? One of them being machine learning, they could be something around visualization um, and they could be other topics. So we're always very happy to hear what those would actually look like. Very quickly, some of you are going to ask me, so I thought I might as well just put it on the slide. Why, why Analyst X? Um, it, it wasn't me being lazy and borrowing uh, a letter of the alphabet that uh, NHSX have as well. Um, no, this is very much in keeping with the line of all, all companies tend to have X as more a northern star, things that people should aspire to. And it chimes a lot with our values and, and, and what we want Analyst X to be. So it's almost a future that doesn't quite exist, but could exist, where we break organizational boundaries, where we work together, where, where we actually work in the open. That is still an aspiration of ours. We haven't quite fully hacked that yet. Um, and, and that's why we've got Analyst X, basically. Uh, again, slides will be available for, for those who want to read them, um, but I'm going to stop very soon, so we might get some Q&A. But I think two key points on this slide are, we, we've definitely seen the value of doing something radically different. Uh, we would never have imagined we would have so many people coming together wanting to share ideas. Um, and, and the key point here to make, which often confuses uh, our, our senior leaders uh, at the center is, well, who owns Analyst X? Well, well, no one does, it's the community. So I think given our very distributed leadership model, we're, we're very open, always keen to work based on what the users want, what the community needs. And I think it's it's, it's a call out for me to, to, to those on the R community, please continue supporting us, but, but also working with us to challenge us as some of you often do, just to make sure that, that, that we are sticking true to our values in Analyst X. Um, again, the, these are the four things that we hope to do in Analyst X. We want to be the go-to place for the data professionals and Atlantic community. We want to be autonomous. We want to focus on education. And we actually want to be the connective tissue that, that, that bridges the various demands that we have in the system from various organizations and trying to match that with the analytical talent that we have because we have so much talent out there um, I, I think, you know, we, we would quite easily be a world-class uh, outfit if we were to benchmark ourselves against the FTSE 500 data and analytic companies. That gives you a quick flavor of some of the things we're currently doing. Uh, again, I've spoken about these, but we'd love for people to, to actually just get in touch with us and say, hey, this is me. I'd love to help with this particular thing, and we can definitely get you going. Because actually, the interesting thing about Analyst X is, we, we don't have a dedicated team working on this. Everyone does it uh, as something on the side, but it's because it's, it's an endeavor that we really, really believe in. Very, very last slide, uh, you'll be relieved to know. Uh, I think it would be wrong of me not to thank uh, all our strategic partners. Um, all of them are literally in the, I wouldn't say the greater and the good, they're all the greater and the greater. Um, and then we're very, very grateful, uh, especially to the NHSR community, uh, A, A for inviting me, but B also, you know, being a true partner with us and helping us to take Analyst X into the future where it needs to be. Right, I'm going to stop there now uh, and I'll take questions and answers. Well, I'll take questions and I'll give the answers, hopefully. Um, yes, uh, question here. Um... 
Oh, sorry, it's my chat's moved. Uh, there are lots of networks being set up at the moment. Uh, AlliceX, NHSR, Hexatime, NHS Python, AFA. As a working analyst, how do you keep track of them all and work out which to engage with? I suppose it's a bit like Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. Um, I mean, you decide which one really works for you uh, and which one gives you the most uh, values, uh, the value for your day to day. Um, again, each have different use cases and what they're actually trying to do. So, so me personally, I like being involved in all of them, but dipping in different levels. Uh, so that would be my answer on that one, Chris. Cool. I've got a question. Please put more questions in the chat. I believe our next speaker's not here as well. So we, this might go on slightly long, but I'm not going to torture Suki too long with questions. So my question would be, there does seem to be quite a big emphasis on machine learning in the NHS at the moment. And my, it's my personal opinion that um, I think statistics is being neglected. And I think that's that's possibly as important <laughs> or more important. So I just wanted to get a comment about that. <laughs> Uh, Chris, I knew you were going to ask me something like that. Yes, and 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 you know what typical strategists are like. You you almost ride the wave. Um, and unfortunately, Chris, you know everyone's talking about machine learning. So if we find a way to make statistics more sexy and exciting, I'd be very glad to have a statistics community of practice. But, okay, but Chris, well, the, but, but, but Chris, the, the the essence of the matter is, I think, if it's machine learning, uh, and I and I jest a bit. If it gets people together to actually do what they need to be doing, that's absolutely fine. Um, I, I suppose my challenge back to you, Chris, would be how do we make it even bigger and better? Because compared to other industries, we're, we're barely scratching the surface of what we could do in healthcare. Yes, I accept your challenge to make statistics sexy. To be honest, I, I thought I was already doing that, so I'm a little disappointed I'm not. But, well, you'd um, be disappointed if I didn't say that. <laughs> the community accepts your challenge. Um, any more? I don't, have we got our next speaker here? I don't think we have. Any more questions in the chat, please? I suppose, Chris, I have one while we're waiting for questions, which is uh, generally there's nothing that appeals to us more as the analyst X core team than folk actually coming to us and saying, you're doing a terrible job with X and Y. We have more experience in it. Can we please take it off your hands and do it? Um, and I think I'm trying to get more and more of that happening. And then the way we're working is it's just a very small core team. Thankfully, we are now getting to cross-organizational working. But I wouldn't want people to think that this is just NHS England improvement in NHSX. I'd, I'd love to have more people as part of our core team uh, wanting to help and support us. Yes, uh, that's yeah, that's a good uh, that's a good uh, ambition. Uh, that Chris, can I just interrupt? Can I just see if Zoe and Hugo? are uh, ready to perhaps to to step in and, and uh, do their talk. Oh, it looks like Zoe's here actually, which is she's very early, which is good. Oh, oh, they're both talking. No, Hugo's not here. I am sorry, Hugo's not here yet. Oh, no, he's okay, that's starting fine. the presentation. <laughs> no, no, that, look, that's uh, absolutely fine. Uh, in, the, in that case, uh, Chris, shall we, um, we have an option either we can take an early break uh, and and just come back a bit, or we can just uh, use this time to carry on a, a conversation and maybe do some of the other things we thought about in terms of pledges and things like that. So, well, I think an early break would probably be the best way of keeping us the time, wouldn't it? Yes. Okay. So, why do we have an early break then? Uh, and we will be back at. Uh, I think we'll we'll have to only we can only be back at eleven o five now. I think and. Uh, We'll have to give Simon a slot for next year's conference, I think. Oh, could we? We couldn't. Could we not just chop chop the order around a bit? No, come back at. Uh, just, just trying to do the maths. He, hello, Tana here from WTV. He's trying to join. If maybe we can give give him another minute, and then oh, I that's, think that's he might great. join. Just just bear with me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, yeah, that's great. Okay. So, Suki, in that case, you've got a question from Adam. Uh, have you had any engagement from Wales, Scotland, or Northern Ireland? Yes, I've just responded to that. So, so, so we've had uh, a fair few folk from Australia, Singapore, China actually get in touch with us. But, but clearly, a lot of the material we have is very UK centric. So, so one of the next things we want to kick off in January is: is there a variant of Analyst X Global? What does that actually look like? It's a bit of a blank canvas at the moment. So, again, Adam and others who are interested in helping us shape what that looks like, I think that would be very, very helpful. I think, Suki, one of the things that um, 
but there have been a number of highlights in the in the conference, you can, as you can imagine. But what, mm. and so I'm not, uh, you know, there were lots of things to mention. But one thing that I thought was a really beautiful example was um, a pharmacist coming together with an operations researcher and uh, a data scientist um, to develop a stock control system for pharmacy. Uh, mm. Now, now, uh, from our point of view, finding a way to bring the problem owner with the the data scientist and the methodologist where required um is is one of the things that it's i think is a we haven't cracked that really and so uh, if we could perhaps work with the analyst x community but to try and bring in a sense of the common problems that we have and then find a way to task uh, to kind of commission in quotes uh, those those projects so that they're built once or twice, you know, by, by one team, but designed to scale up for every other hospital in the country, really. Uh, do, uh, and I know that, that Sarah Colkin from NHSX also has the same kind of passion and vision, but do you have anything to say about things like that? So, 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 so Mohammed, that's definitely the next phase where we want to get to. So at the moment, we've just played with that idea with very much uh, using hackathons. So just bear with me for a moment, Mohammed. But where we want to get to actually is having the uh, manager with, with the clinician, with the analyst, or, or however you want to configure these teams. It's actually a team sport to actually create these products. We want to try and do that through what we've called the data and analytics accelerator. The idea being you get questions either coming from the community or the exec, uh, and then you get teams forming that will solve these challenges that won't necessarily be analytical challenges. And then we actually fund the the, the one or two uh, projects that that do really really well in terms of creating an alpha and a beta. Again, at the moment, uh, it is quite conceptual. Our thinking and Muhammad is definitely a conversation that 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 we need to have. Great, yeah. That, thank you, Suki. Look, I, I see that Hugo's online now. I think, and also Zoe's. I'm just going to ask again, Zoe and Hugo, are you happy to perhaps uh, just go on to your talk now? Um, we possibly can. Is the person who's supposed to be coming on not able to? No, I don't think so. And I just we just need to crack on with the program if that's all right. So sorry to rush you a bit, Zoe, but take your time. If you're if you want to just tee up, and then I'll. Well, just get... if it's difficult, we I mean we could could we come back at five two possibly? Would that be a, a way of doing it? Maybe give Simon time to join, and then. Uh... Yeah, just come, come uh, break now. Come back okay. at five two, and then okay. do Simon and, and the next talk. I think that'll that'll uh, squeeze everything in. I'll call you back for me and Hugo if that's all right. Chris, just put that in the chat, please. Okay, yeah, let's have a have a break. Um, Thank you. Um, so, so how long is the break, Chris? Uh, I'm trying to do maths live. Uh, what, what do we want? I think if we come back at five two, we'll give okay. Simon ten minutes instead of twenty, okay. and then and then we'll be on track, won't we? Then and then right. Hugo at eleven oh five is planned. Then we're back on the thing. So we just cut his talk slightly and move okay. the break. Okay, we're, we're back at at, at um, five to eleven, please. Yeah, five to eleven. Thank you. Okay, everyone. thank you everybody. See you soon. Thanks.
Hello, is this thing on? Excellent. No worries, just been having a few technical issues to say the very least.
Right, we're back. I hope you can hear or see me or something. Um, I wouldn't be me if I didn't make the joke that um, the problem was caused by um, NHS IT being uh, over restrictive. The irony of that having that in an R conference is just too delicious not to point out. Um, so now without further ado, let's go on to our next speaker, Simon Wellesley Miller, who will be talking about interactive reports using HTML widgets in R Markdown. Hello there. Um, sorry, camera not working, but hopefully you can hear me okay. Um, first things first, I'm just going to pop into a into the chat uh, a Google's form uh, web link. If anybody has got two seconds, if they could just go into that and complete it. Uh, I am using it to uh, data mine some horribly personal information from everybody, which I will chuck into a report in a minute. Um, let me go ahead. So if you have got two seconds, if you could fill that in. Otherwise, uh, what I'm just going to briefly talk through is um, how we can use some funky widgets to uh, spice up our data, our actual output. So I'm sure we've heard lots of things about how we can create funky models and do sort of various bits and pieces with our data. But actually, uh, how we can actually output that data and make it uh, really, really cool and funky and interactive. So looking at HTML widgets. So I'm not going to go specifically through major bits of code for you, but just sort of more or less show you the output, the code to produce this uh, will be available and I'll, I'll make that certainly so um, I'm gonna whiz through so this is a big interactive markdown report which I've created um, uh, using the joyous of our markdown uh, various bits and pieces in here showing how you can do sort of various bits and bits of formatting around text and uh, and your code uh, which basically you can do lots of nice lists and sort of blocks and make bits and pieces. Um, and then looking at how you can actually sort of show off that data. So one of the really simple things is doing some really simple sort of columns and, and tables, which is really, really simple. Um, you can do things like change your fonts and uh, do lots of horrible things like putting it into Comic Sans. Um, but actually, let's look at some data. So here's a, a very simple chart of, of uh, uh, RDE &E attendances um, by provider code. Uh, what we can do is create tab sets within our, our markdown report. So if we wanted to show a comparison across three different sites, rather than have three different charts, what you can do is create a little tab set and sort of click through them one to the other. So in under the hood, you've created three charts, but generally I find if you give people free charts, they find it really, really hard to sort of compare one to another. So what you can do is like I say, set up little tab sets and you can flick from one to the other. Um, also, we obviously create a lot of data tables. Um, the bog standard one, which if you spit out in R, uh, a table, it comes out something like this, which is completely and utterly horribly and ugly. Uh, so what we can do is chuck it into cable, where we can create a nice little, just the same data, but in a, in a bit more of a sort of a funkier format. Um, which allows us to make that a little bit pretty. Also has a nice little hover over if you uh, use your mouse and it sort of highlights the area. Uh, you can do all sorts of things with that, same as you could do with a uh, sort of Excel table. You can indent things, you can do sort of conditional formatting, you can change text types, do all, all manner of sort of things of that and like i say if you're just looking at producing sort of some static tables uh, they just come out really pretty statics all very well and good but what we want is some interactive data so uh, again you can sort of send out these reports um, instead of just having a, a static table what we have here is a nice interactive table so we can sort of click on these boxes and apply filters to our data uh, we can sort of filter it down to a specific uh, organization code, for instance, uh, and that will sort of filter through our data. Um, and again, we can have all these lovely little widgets that uh, apply, and then it will apply to the data set. Um, you can then use that. You can press a copy button, which will just add it to the clipboard, which you can do whatever you want. Uh, you can press the CSV button, which will take your whatever your filtered data and download that as a CSV. You can print it or you can PDF it. Uh, you can also show more entries if you have uh, more entries and expand the table. And again, that's all sort of interactive. Um, you can also do searches within the data. So if we will look for 8400, oh, I've got number on 8400. 
yeah there we go and then it will filter that data down to this just single line uh, which again is a really nice way of producing sort of big data tables, um, but in a nice sort of interactive way. Uh, another thing you can use is React table, which is much more when you've got sort of a, a nested hierarchy of data. So we have uh, individual providers here, and then we can sort of drill down into sort of very specifics um, and sort of open and close individual uh, in individual providers based on their code and, and sort of see data like that. This is really, really good when you um, sort of want to do um, uh, sort of aggregates on, on your data. So here we've just grouped it by dates uh, and then we've got a median attendance, uh, maximum number of breaches and minimum breaches for this date. We can then drill down in that to that data uh, and it creates the median, the max, and the min uh, based across those three different areas. Uh, and within that, there's all these separate providers. So we could then drill down even further and get that down to an individual provider level um, of their median attendance, max attendances, mean attendances. Um, the, the table does all the hard work for you. So basically, you just tell it what the hierarchy is and what the calculation is, and it will then automatically generate all those. It's not a case of that you have to calculate all these uh, minimums and maximums and medians. It does all that for you in, in a really nice way. Um, so uh, plots, I don't know. Uh, so we've got basic basic plots here, um, all very well and groovy, uh, sort of looking at our different types over time. Uh, kind of interesting, but obviously we want interactive. So exactly the same plot as above, uh, but put into a package called Plotly, uh, which then allows us to do things like hover over, so we can see sort of individual uh, time points and, and read those. We can click on individual uh, things and turn them on and off. So we can sort of plot several different teams all at once and uh, see what those go through. Uh, you can also do things like click and drag over an area and it will zoom into that specific area if you so wish. Um, and then if you want to, you can uh, download the plot that you've created or, uh, uh, you know, if you've got a really big section and you want to zoom in onto it, it will it will do that. Uh, another thing you can do is animated graphs, uh, where we're looking at sort of time series. So we can plot a lovely time series over time. Oh, no, it's gone wrong. Uh, sorry, that's my mistake. I think I've uh, got a bit of an artifact in the data. But you get the idea that you can uh, plot those over time. I've got a much better example of that in a minute. Um, another thing you can do with die graphs is it's really good at looking sort of uh, uh, time series over time. So you can do things like click and drag and look at sort of a specific time series and hone into a specific time series. Uh, this one's also got something clever, although I haven't marked, made, labeled it here, where it's basically calculates a rolling average over a period. Um, and what you can do here is actually sort of specify your period. Um, obviously, we've been very much looking at sort of rolling uh, data, especially when with COVID, because obviously we want to look at a sort of a seven day rolling uh, rather than sort of individual days. And you can just basically input a new figure into that table, uh, into that chart, and it will create a new rolling uh, average based on what you've put in there. And it will just automatically dynamically update that. Uh, we've got the library tree map, um, which is kind of a square version of a pie chart, basically. Two minutes, uh, please, Simon. Oh, my goodness me. Collapsible tree. Uh, let's go. Am I, have I really got two minutes? Blimey. Um, collapsible tree allows you to sort of look at networks and uh, sort of develop network processes. Uh, we've got an interactive Sankey diagram here where we can look at a uh, sort of flow over time and click on individual sections and we can sort of see flow over time and it also shows histograms over time. While that is running, let's just see if I can get this working very, very quickly in the background. So uh, we can do interactive maps where we can sort of zoom in and out and sort of click teams on and off. Uh, we can do word clouds where we can uh, look at words and uh, do various bits and pieces on that. And there's our pivot table, which allows us to uh, create pivot tables within R. And uh, those are sort of all super duper interactive. Let's see if this is working. 
so that's still going. So the R pivot table allows you to sort of create tables. You can create, uh, let's bring that one back uh, over here. Uh, we can do attendances. Um, and instead of just a table of account, we can do things like uh, add in a median and it will do a median function across your pivot table. All right, let's see if this is still going. That's still going. Okay, I think I'm hideously out of time. Uh, very, very sorry due to sort of various technical issues. Um, if possible, I will share the output of this if it's finally finished. We all want to see it. We've got to see this before we go. We've got anyway, to see so. it. It's got to see this. All right, it's this will coming. take three minutes. Come on, knit you, blighter. Come on. There we go. Right. So let's have a, oh my goodness, pretty, isn't it? Okay. So very, very quickly, we have 31 respondents. Let's have a look. Um, so the interesting questions are, where are the cats, the dragons, and the puppies? So we have kittens around these areas. We have puppies in these areas, and we have dragons here. Strangely, we've got a big cluster of dragons in Wales. Who would have thought it? Uh, our feelings over the last 12 months, just seeing a lot of tired. Uh, quick uh, word cloud on how we're describing this uh, Lots of inspiring, lots of fun, lots of excitement. Uh, looking at the sentiment analysis between those two uh, words that you've put in, those two sections, we've got an average sentiment for sort of the last 12 months, which looks very, very flat and bad, but very, very positive around the NHSR conference and doing a sort of uh, a density plot around the sentiments of those is, is really good. And then finally, looking at our uh, 3D uh, hideous chart here never do 3d charts but just because you can um and if i've got just two seconds i'm going to just go one last thing uh looking at plotting in four dimensions uh where we can look at a, a cluster profile of our patients uh, sorry of our age and gender patients over time uh, and this is we can put it over time and we can sort of then animate it so we can see uh, due, due to COVID, we've seen quite a bulge in the sort of lower 20 to 30 females in our uh, population density uh, chart. So if I speed that up, over time, we can see from the start of COVID to sort of post COVID, we can see bulges here. So again, sort of when you're trying to plot things over time and sort of show those, uh, you can do some really nice sort of animated charts and widgets. Right, I better finish because I know I'm hideously out of time. Thank Great. you very much. Thank you, Simon. Uh, very good condensing there. Um, right, next speakers, please. So we have Hugo and Zoe, who are going to talk about shiny doesn't have to be scary, an easy way in with our markdown. Thank you, Chris. Um, I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Um, if not, I please. can't see your screen. I can see Zoe. Okay, that's cool. I'm sharing again. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, all good. Fab, here we go. Thanks, everyone, and greetings from Cardiff, Wales, the home of dragons. Um, and um, here's what we're going to talk about today. Um, yeah, we're going to talk about how our markdown can be perhaps a comparative simple way to learn Shiny. And um, then I'm gonna pass over to Zoe, uh, my colleague's gonna take you through um, a bit about our learning resource we've been putting together to, to do that. So yeah, I'm one of the um, analysts in the, in the Public Health Wales Observatory analytical team here in Cardiff. And we've been using um, our Markdown and Shiny together for a while. Um, just in case some of you um, are not clear on what Shiny is, maybe very new to R, then um, when you see this kind of magic happening, um, with our um, interactive products that you see on the internet. When you see drop downs and sliders and, and interaction with charts, then it's the shiny package um, that is making that happen. Um, so I wonder which of these personas you identify more with. Um, maybe you're more like our Mandalorian friend over here. Maybe you're really feeling shiny at the moment. Um, or maybe um, like his counterpart here, you're just not feeling it so much. Maybe you've been learning R for a while. When it comes to making interactive stuff with Shiny, just not quite there. So it's this group that we're gonna be talking to more today. Um, if you're over here, um, then great, fantastic. Maybe you've been learning R for a while. You're well into Shiny and enjoying it, that's great. Maybe the utility of this is just 
to have something you can point other colleagues to, people who are, who are learning R and looking for a, perhaps an easier way into Shiny. But yeah, it's these guys that we're, that we're looking at today. Um, so I wonder if you are in that camp, um, what's been putting you off uh, getting into Shiny so far? Maybe it's this kind of front end, back end thing uh, with UI and server code and, and how to interact. Maybe some of the terminology um, can be tricky. Um, maybe you're just not quite sure how to get into it and where to start, it seems foreboding. Or maybe like me, you get error messages um, like this. I think I had this one at least 100 times before I worked out what it meant. Um, so what next? Well, of course, um, there's lots of training out there. There's external training. Um, lots of people can provide that, but why not get it for free? Of course, Chris is, is providing, um, very kindly providing this training at the end of November in Shiny. And, and of course, being a great open source community, there is lots of free online stuff. So mastering Shiny is, um, is really good. Um, but we want to propose something else. Um, and maybe it's something you could even do as a precursor to those other things as a, as a way in. And um, that's using Shiny in R Markdown. Um, or we imagine R Markdown running a bit more like that. Um, no disrespect to Hoff, I just think he's got a fairly limited um, set of skills. And I think, um, as someone has written, it's the geeks that tend to, to rule, rule the world. Um, what is our markdown, just in case it's not a familiar um, thing to you? So it's a play on words between um, markup and uh, markdown. So HTML or hypertext markup language is, is how web pages get written. And basically, um, you write a document, and then that document gets marked up. With different tags um, so your top header is marked up with a h1 so the browser knows that that's your top header and then text all in the body um, your browser knows where to put things so when your web browser starts up it looks at that document and it knows from the markup where to put different bits of text to make that web page um, markdown can basically make things that look like um, markup but it's much easier it, it does a lot of the work for you so it's something that everyone can use and the the r markdown package um, can make static things, can make PDFs, uh, work docs, um, as well as, uh, importantly for us today, as well as interactive documents. So what's an interactive document? Um, well, it's basically an R Markdown file um, into which you've added Shiny widgets and outputs. So this, this links really well with Simon's um, talk a minute ago and a lot of what Simon showed you could put into your R Markdown file. So basically you write that, um, you use the R Markdown language in the R Markdown file, um, and then you can launch that as a Shiny app. And as the R Studio guys are saying here, um, our Markdown uh, it can provide a really easy way to build lightweight Shiny apps. So if you are new to R, value you to R, and you want to dip your toe into Shiny, um, we think this could be um, a really nice way to do it. Why do you think it's more easy? Well, um, you don't get this kind of back-end, front-end split. Um, if you want to make an interactive chart or a table, you just do that in one step. Uh, it's also really easy to add text um, because you don't have to make um, a container or a particular panel. Um, your R Markdown file, when you open that in our studio, that's already um, your kind of page and you can just write it, you can just write stuff in there and it will come out in the output. And because of that, it's you get really simple layouts. Um, so you can you can lay things out pretty easily. There is a flip side, of course. Um, yeah, we're not saying this is the best way to use Shiny all the time. I think we were saying it's a nice way in to learn Shiny. You will have less flexibility further down the line if you stick with our markdown than you would if you, if you built um, a full-on Shiny app. Um, so just more background about my team and Public Health Wales. So um, we started out, I think, using Shiny um, with our markdown. <coughs> Excuse me. And we found that just quite a nice way to learn. Um, and we've, we've moved on and, and made, um, we made a dashboard to show our child measurement program statistics. And we use Flex dashboard for that. So that's another package um, you can add in. So you're still using our markdown, um, but Flex dashboard makes it really easy to get that classic um, dashboard uh, structure with a menu bar across the top or a sidebar. Um, but again, I think very easy to use. Um, and then we've, we've been working on a COVID recovery profile See how the population is recovering from COVID um, for the last year or more. And to do that, we've, we've developed a set of, um, of modular R Markdown documents where you've got kind of one uh, overarching R Markdown and it draws in lots of different R Markdown documents um, to, make that, um, to make that interactive tool 
And so that's been um, better for lots of different people to be able to work on it. You can have different members of the team working on different bits of that. And then at the end, when you want to publish it, you can bring it all together. So you can go quite a long way with our markdown. Um, but I think, as I say, what we're saying today is that um, our markdown is a nice way in to learn Shiny. And then I think you can always then move on to, to the greater flexibility you get um, from using the Shiny dashboard package or from, from making more complex um, Shiny apps once you've, once you've learned more. So I hope that's helped to give a bit of background about um, why we've used Shiny with our markdown as a way in. Um, I'm going to pass you over to Zoe now um, to tell us a bit more about um, the, the learning resource we've developed. Cool. Thank you very much, Hugo, uh, for the really interesting background into why our markdown is such an incredibly useful part of our studio. Um, so now you know Shiny in our markdown is like the easy route into creating a dashboard, where do you actually begin? Um, and so to help you with that, we have created a handy how-to guide on our Public Health Wales Observatory GitHub account. I'm just going to post the link to that in the chat there so everyone can have a look at it if they'd like to. Um, and it's also here on the um, slide if anyone's watching afterwards on the recording and can't see the, the link. Um, so yeah, more than welcome to visit that. Um, now, as we are limited on time, um, instead of going through every kind of step of how to build your own um, shiny dashboard using our markdown, I'm just gonna give you the tools to go away and try it yourself. Um, so Hugo, can I take the screen, um, screen sharing please? Thank you very much. Can everyone see my screen? Yeah. Excellent. Thank you so much. Okay, so I am currently sh uh, screen sharing the um, GitHub account that I mentioned uh, that's in the link. And so uh, do forgive us, we don't normally use GitHub, so this might seem a bit... Um, you know, basic to the GitHub pros out there, um, but we have basically uploaded um, some files for you to uh, download onto your own, um, own desktop to be able to have a play around with. Um, so in here, we've got um, the test shiny doc, which is the RMD that um, you can either download and just steal bits from, run it yourself. Um, or you can basically use our 10 part video guide here. Um, so it's, it's me talking uh, about a minute at a time. So I do apologize, you'll be sick of the sound of my voice if you do listen to it. Um, but it's, um, yeah, a 10 part guide and basically just tells you very basically step by step how to start up um, on our markdown with Shiny um, and then how to add packages, adding your data. Um, what our chunks actually are and how to create drop down uh, input selections. Then got creating outputs using um, multiple different functions and then fluid row, which um, you mentioned earlier, just a, a way of uh, changing your um, shiny app to look a little bit um, different, just moving things around. Uh, and then also creating GG plots and plotly charts. Um, data tables, adding those in, and then also adding tabs to the dashboard as well and some images. So like I said, um, everything you need to follow this is in the uh, files up here that you can download. So you've got um, the data, um, which is this NHS R ONS mortality subset. And this has been um, taken from the NHS R package on the R library, which is a really useful resource if anyone wants some dummy data to play around with. Um, and this script here is just us dra uh, dragging that data into a R script and manipulating it a tiny bit and then saving this. So you don't need to open this, but this is the data you could use. Um, there's also a couple images for you to try and add into your dashboard if you'd like to. Obviously, it's a bit of a shameless plug from us putting our logo in there, but there's also the NHS R logo there as well. Um, so that's pretty much what's on our GitHub account. It's like a, a nice kind of step-by-step -step guide as to how to create your own. And if you follow that step-by-step -step guide, the output you can create is something like this. So you've got um, this nice dashboard here, and I'm gonna go through the code with you as we go along as well. Um, so you've got your title, uh, author, and date here, and that's done in this part up here. You then have your first chunk, which um, 
this tells it that it's a shiny markdown document and then you bring your packages and your data. And then you have your image here, which you just bring in in this part of the code here. You then have your title, which comes up here, and then you've got your drop downs. So these drop downs are um, reactive, so and they're dependent as well. So if you've got a, a by age drop down here. You've then got um, dependent kind of age groups there, which are really um, useful to be able to have that reactivity there. So in doing that, changing this, you can then see that the title here updates dependent on what you are changing. Um, so that's a reactive title then. And that reactive title is created um, in this section here as well. And then as you go down through the script, you can see we've got a chunk here, uh, which creates this chart. And um, like in the previous um, presentation, you can see that we've also got the nice tool tips here, which help you see what, where the data is. You've got all this extra stuff here as well. Um, further down we go, then we've got a, a table chunk here, which just shows you um, this bit. This is the code that feeds into this. And so you've got a table that you can look at as well. So that's pretty much what you can make using that step-by-step -step guide. And of course, that step-by-step -step guide is just an overview. Um, and you can really um, put your own data in there. You can use it to your advantage if you want or just avoid it entirely and just open um, the R Shiny template that R gives you. So to be able to actually open a template in R, very first step in how to create a, a R Markdown document with a Shiny um, element, you go to open a new uh, file, click R Markdown, and then we come down to Shiny here and click Shiny document, name it whatever you like, and then press OK. And when you do that, you get this. Um, you'll need to save it before you run it, but when you run it, press this button here. should run. <laughs> um, and this is basically the template the, that um, R Markdown gives you. So it's slightly different to what we've got in our 10 part step-by-step uh, -step guide. But of course you can just use this instead of our uh, 10 part guide. So it uses the user eruption data that um, comes with the um, standard R and it's got some nice scrolling elements to it, which makes it reactive, some drop downs, and also an embedded application here with um, buttons there that you can press as well as the tabs like an R1 as well. So yeah, there's plenty of stuff you can play around with as a beginner, um, thinking about Shiny in an RMD. Um, so there's lots of different elements that you can use and uh, you can steal bits from R script from this script. Uh, you can work on this or you can start from scratch, it's totally up to you. Now, Obviously, you can only really scratch the surface of um, how to use Shiny with a 10 part um, intro guide. Um, so the possibilities are almost endless um, with what you can do with the Shiny bash dashboard from an RMD. And as Hugo mentioned earlier, we've actually created a um, recovery profile from COVID-19 for Wales um, using this Shiny RMD dashboard um, method. So we've got lots of elements in here, um, taking it a step further. So we've got download documents here, summary reports. It's also got um, some nice hidden bits here where you can put your technical information in there. So there's plenty of elements you can add in. You can also add in maps, um, lots of different bits and bobs you can do. Um, so you can really kind of start from absolute basics and really build yourself up. This uh, recovery profile uses a skeleton script so we've got like a, this is like a parent script and then each data section here is a child script which is brought in to try and keep that one um, overall script nice and tidy so uh, it's not loads and loads of lines of code in there um, so yeah that's pretty much the example of um, a slightly more advanced shiny dashboard from uh, an rmd and so in conclusion then you really don't need to be overwhelmed uh, with the idea of Shiny being quite a scary and confusing part of R. I know I was initially when I started learning Shiny, um, the server and UI functions, all the error messages, yeah. 
So why bother with those if you're a beginner with Shiny when you can let R do all the hard work for you and you can have all the fun. So thank you ever so much for listening. Are there any questions at all? I can't see any questions in the chat. I've got a question, which is um, how easy is it to uh, change if you've built something on Markdown, how easy is it to change into a, a full shiny application? And do you yourself use that as part of your workflow? Yeah, so did I want to say? Yeah. Um, yeah um, it's not super easy, Chris, I don't think. And it's not something we do. I guess in theory, once you've got, um, yeah, I think in terms of the, like inputs and um, and chart code, obviously that you could paste that in. But I think that key difference where you don't have, so in a in a proper shiny app, you you create something on the server side, and you store that in an object, and then you you then output that in the UI side because you don't have that in the R Markdown document. Um, it's not that easy um, to kind of go from one to the other. Oh yeah, more questions now. Questions coming in too late. Um... Are there any information governance issues with the data that's just stored behind the dashboard? Can the user access it? Yeah, no, that's all that's all squared away because we don't we only upload aggregated data and, and rates, for example. There's no access to, to individual level data. Obviously, you have to be very careful about that. So yeah, we basically we 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 have we have scripts that create um, data files, uh, RDS format, for example. And then those those data files are all aggregated, and then the the L markdown um, just grabs those those aggregated numbers from the, from the data files. Cool. It's a common worry, actually. That so it's an interesting question that I think people do worry about mm. because obviously yeah. HTML has got a lot of junk behind it. People do worry about what exactly is in it. Right, I'm going to push us on. There's a question about Golem in the chat. We're not going to deviate talking about Golem. Yeah. Please come and find me and talk about Golem. Um, so we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you very much for that. So we have now, uh, where's my notes? Uh, Dr. Kate Bamford uh, from the East Midlands Health Protection Health Security Agency, who will be talking about using R Markdown, React Table, and Crosstalk to create an interactive COVID-19 review tool. Hello. So I think, oh, yeah. Sorry, go on. Hi. Yeah, I'll just start sharing my screen. Yep, yeah, got it. Thanks. Great. Um, so this um, follows on quite well from the last couple of talks. So my talk is basically a case study of how to create sort of an interactive uh, markdown file. So it uses um, a few of the HTML widgets that Simon spoke about in his tool. Um, so just to start with, I always find it quite interesting to find out how people got to where they are with R. So um, I thought I'd share uh, where I am. So I've been working for UKHSA since October, so not the whole pandemic. Um, before that, I was doing a um, PhD actually um, on sheep. So swap the sheep for people. And um, at the beginning of my PhD, I was introduced to R, had a sort of a crash course in how to use for loops, which wasn't necessarily the best introduction, but throughout the next four or five years, started to sort of replace Excel with R. Um, so started with ggplot through various data manipulation, writing mod models. And I actually wrote my thesis in R Markdown. I got bored of having to save my plots again and again and again. So decided R Markdown was the way, which has given me quite a good sort of background to what R Markdown can do for you. Um, most of my learning through R is sort of other people's code, Stack Overflow, or settings like this would be uh, this conference. So hopefully the like, stretch of my talk sort of helps people to learn. I've got quite a lot of bits of code in there um, and I can share this later if it helps. So um, a bit of background to the data for this um, tool so it makes a bit more sense. So it's all based on the contact tracing data. So cases that um, have a positive PCR test contacted by test and trace and um, asked to fill in a questionnaire about where they've been. Uh, this is before um, they catch coronavirus and this is a period, backward period, which is considered the sort of exposure period where someone might have caught coronavirus. And then the forward period, which we consider sort of the infectious period where they um, may have been able to transmit it. 
the um, enhanced contact tracing team at UKHSA have created um, a couple of really good algorithms which are used to identify where there might be possible public health incidents using this forward and backward data that's collected from cases. So uh, there are two main reports generated from this information. The backward data has common exposures where there are two or more cases in the same setting during the backward period. It is a bit more complicated than this, but for the purposes of this talk, that's all you need to know. And then the postcode coincidences are two or more cases in the forward period. And these reports are shared via fairly large tables on a Power BI dashboard where which is secure and it can be reviewed by UKHSA and local authority health protection teams. And um, they can review the data and identify whether or not there's an incident that needs following up. So where does R come in? So um, within the East Midlands health protection team, we saw there's a potential opportunity, firstly, to improve the navigation between the potential situations that are being highlighted and their cases. So at the moment, um, well, originally, there still is now, but there are um, two large tables for each of the two directions. So that means there's four tables in total. The first is a summary file that has the exposures, all the coincidences, and the various summary statistics. So the postcode, the type of exposure, the, the school, the number of cases in the last few days, um, last 28 days, the last case that was there, that sort of thing, and also a unique ID. And then that unique ID is followed through in the line list where there's individual information about each case. So um, their, post, uh, their home address, their uh, age, date of birth, phone number, all of that information from the case. But this is at event level, so they can be in that line list multiple times, either in multiple exposures, but also in the same exposures more than once if they were say at school every day in a week, they'd appear all five days. So um, Simon spoke about um, this um, package React table. Um, it's a really, really useful um, package that can create interactive HTML tables. And the biggest um, use is this nested tables, but it's also really highly customizable with other HTML widgets, and it is easy to use within our markdown. So, um, here, um, this is a example, um, small example of the actual tool. So it is a bit bigger than this. It's got some more information. This is all dummy data. Um, but each of these rows is a common exposure. So it's got some of that um, summary data I was talking about and some of uh, the last recorded case. But what Reactive allows us to do is click down and show the case information. So we've got an individual ID that can be looked up on the test and trace system. Things like where they started, they, this particular person started their symptom start date or their age or their actual home lo um, local authority. So this could be, and um, they could be part of a common exposure in one local authority, but um, actually live outside of it. Say it's a campsite or a um, then it could, all the people could be outside of their local authority. And then the health protection teams would know that this isn't something that's driving, directly driving case rates in the region. Having the age could be useful. You see that it's a, this example is a theatre where there are quite a few people that are in that 60 plus age group. And maybe this would be a higher concern. Um, the dates that they were there which again means that you can identify if it's a bigger epidemiological link. So these people there on a Friday night, I guess. And we've summarized the, each person into, deduplicated them into a single line and then put all of the dates they were at a place into one place. So this person was there for five days. And this whole table, each option has that drop down. Um, so I've just shown the code for a single um, nested table here. So this is a short example. In the tool itself, there's actually three levels, um, but we won't go into that. Um, so React table, you're just telling it to look for the actual data. And um, this is the main list. Um, this one here with three columns and three rows. That's just data. 
and here I've shown the common exposure ID and that was, that's what links up to the cases and I've called this here, this all the line list is called nested data. Um, within React table, you, this little line here is telling it which one matches, uh, how they match together to create the, net, the nesting. And then with a bit of help from HTML tools, it's simply another React table within the React table. And this means that anything you can do to React table, the main React table, you can do to the other React table inside, as in you could continue to nest as well. So at this point, we'd um, improve navigation between cases and situations. But for the tool to actually truly be useful, um, it also had to be user-friendly, um, sufficiently enhance, enhance the current outputs. So they were on a Power BI dashboard. Power BI isn't particularly difficult to navigate. Um, particularly, Power BI has some really good filter options, which is really helpful for things that require prioritization. It also had to exist in a standalone secure document. Um, and be producible every day for every local authority. At this point, there was interest in getting this national, and unless it could be produced every day, it didn't have much use. Okay, to start with, um, cover the user-friendly and the enhanced current outputs. So the main part was to making the information easy to view. Fast and easy, improve that human readability. Um, so we'll just take um, an example here on the right, um, where we've added some HTML tags. So these um, tags are something that's been added to this data. It uses the same data, still uses that questionnaire, but where the original report just said, this is a person in a common exposure. This is now looking at the rest of the questionnaire. And if the person also said they were there, as well as being part of the common exposure, they get marked as a workplace. If they're under 18, they get marked as a student because it, occupation and education is the same question. And if they don't, they get a tag at all if they weren't working in that location. And this can be really helpful. For example, the supermarket, um, it's frequency bias. It's probably going to turn up because lots of people are going to the supermarket all the time. But if a supermarket turned up on a common exposure and 50% of those cases were a workplace, then potentially we're seeing a workplace outbreak and it requires further, it might require further follow up. Um, and again, this is just, it's actually, it looks quite complicated, but within the React table function, we're allowed to um, put in what we want it to do with the columns in a list. Each one of these are just renaming them. This one here, the slightly longer one, is where we've asked it to do something with the type. And it just uses a HTML down to here. And um, I won't go through it, but um, you can look at this later if I share the slides. Um, so, and this bit of um, CSS here is simply in a, a chunk right at the bottom of the R markdown in a CSS chunk. So it could be outside of the R markdown, but it's fine to be within the same file. Um, the other thing that we've added um, was adding data without widening the table. So I was keen not to have a very long table that you had to slide left to right to actually view the data. So adding any more data was going to make this column longer, wider. Um, so one of the things that's been added and the part that's been added to this data is information on HP zone. HP zone is um, the UK HSA case management system. And this tells us if a health protection team is currently managing a situation. So say there's a care home on the report or a school on the report, and it's got HP zone information on it. We know that the health protection team is managing the situation or potentially they managed it in the past. So we can see that they've opened it recently or they opened it a while ago. Um, but there's quite a lot of information. This would have made the table really wide. So by using um, HTML tools again within this um, columns function within React table. This time um, we're using the value of the cell each time. So we take the first column, this section here, take the first column, and then we will ask it to create a list where it's the value of the first 
um, the actual column we're looking at and then add in the other values of that column we want. And then finally, we tell React Table we don't want it to show these columns again. So um, this is one of the biggest problems that came across with the idea of having an R markdown versus having a shiny um, app. So a shiny app allows you to have that reactivity, um, be able to create uh, filters and options and change how your data looks within an app. Now, without being put onto a server like um, the previous talk was showing, that's really difficult. Crosstalk allows us to get around this. So Crosstalk is an add-on to the HTML widgets package. And what's really helpful is it allows cross-widget interactions. So it allows um, HTML widgets to talk to each other without any dependencies. It doesn't require Shiny or anything else. It can still run within the HTML, interactive HTML. So again, I've got an example here. Um, and what we do is instead so if I down here, I've got the example of the React table um, function. Instead of using data, we're now using something I've called data cross. And this is a crosstalk object, which is created using this little function here. It's created a new crosstalk object that is grouped by common exposures in this case. And this new crosstalk object is now used in any HTML widget that we're using. So this is a crosstalk um, option, which is filter select. There are quite a lot of different filter options. And again, we're using this new crosstalk object in each one. And it tells crosstalk that they are working together and allows that cross widget interactivity. And here's an example. We've got total cases in 28 days. And we can use a slider just like you can in Shiny to change the way the table looks. Uh, here's this one's a select and you're allowed to do multiple things. So say you were only looking for emergency services or maybe you're looking at healthcare and entertainment. And this, there are quite a few different filter options available in the final tool, which allows for this um, prioritization to happen by, by human um, viewing. So, um, and this follows on to the idea that it needed to be standalone and secure and re reproducible for every local authority every day. And so our markdown was chosen. It doesn't require a shiny server. It can be, um, each document can be shared as a HTML file. If you wanted to email them, you could, um, but we are um, uploading into a secure SharePoint file. So, um, we can utilize security groups that are already in place with that SharePoint because they can borrow off the Power BI security groups. Um, the HTML widgets work within, um, all the HTML widgets that we used in this report still work within the HTML file and relative ease at creating each local authority. Just a really quick rundown on how the markdown works with the different UTLAs. So it's a parameter function within the YAML here. And this particular example is running it for Leicester. And very early on in the R markdown the file, I set the region to be params dollar sign UTLA, mainly because I'm too lazy to write this out every time. And then at the beginning of the R markdown, it can filter the data to only be the data applicable for that region and run the report for that. And then we have a for loop, which just runs through all of the 152 upper tier local authorities um, in England so that it can run the report each time. We um, set an output file. And this output file creates say, um, is in, within a particular folder um, that has it, which is a um, user function that I've created that creates the structure of the date, the center, and the UTLA. And this allows us to create, create the security groups at the center level. So everyone in the Southwest can see all of the Southwest UTLAs or at the UTLA level. So if um, you have permissions to see a single UTLA, that's what you'll be able to see. 
Um, and then these um, reports are all uploaded into their with their folder structure up to the um, SharePoint using uh, Microsoft 365R, which is a really useful package as well. So just to conclude, um, a tool is created in R which allows human assessment of potential COVID-19 clusters. It uses quite a few different ARM packages um, to enhance that interactivity. Um, it only depends on a modern internet browser. And R is used in pretty much the full pipeline, so from the data manipulation all the way up to uploading to the SharePoint site. So um, just a few thanks. Thanks to the Enhanced Contact Tracing team and the rest of the ICERT developer group for helping support in developing the tool. And um, thanks to everyone for listening. Any questions or comments, feel free to ask. Great, thanks very much. We're going to leave questions just to keep us the time, but thank you very much. So I'm being quite inspired myself. I must admit, I just use Shiny for absolutely everything. You made me realize actually there might be a more intelligent way of doing things. So I'm going to go away and think about that. Um, I think we are collating the slides somewhere. I think someone mentioned that on the Slack. So, but I forget how exactly, but yes, we would absolutely love to uh, to take the slides off you and compile them, probably compile them on GitHub somewhere. So thank you for that. Um, right, so there's been some confusion about the breaks, primarily because uh, neither me nor I'm having it seem can do maths at speed because we've used two computers for too long. There is in fact a break, it's coming up next. So we're gonna be breaking between 12.05 and 12.25, but before that, oh look, Freud's come to join the, uh, join the proceedings. Before that, we have Kieran Zucker, uh, a, clinical lecturer at the University of Leeds who will be talking about self-service analytics and automatic document creation with R. Thank you. Right, let me uh, get my slides up for you. So hopefully uh, you can now see my slides. Um, so my name is Kieran. I'm a clinical oncologist based in Leeds, uh, and I'm a clinical lecturer in health data science and machine learning engineering at the University of Leeds. Um, this talk probably follows on quite nicely from the talks that we've just been hearing, um, because this is really about how we can start to make best use of information that organisations are collecting themselves um, and uh, using R to do that. So I'm going to start off by um, essentially just talking a little bit about the kind of healthcare landscape, particularly in the area of oncology and how we ended up coming to the position that we're at now. A brief mention on some of the tooling, although I'm not going to go into any great detail on that because we've obviously just heard quite a bit about Shiny and Markdown over the talks so far this morning. But then I'm going to focus on um, a project that we've done in order to try and make best use of our cancer data, which is um, called Orga. So um, as all of you will be aware, um, there's a lot of information in the media about the capabilities of potentially turning uh, big data and huge volumes of data into real world insight. And you don't have to look very far before you start to see lots of news articles about how information is gonna be transforming the way that we deliver healthcare. Um, and when you look at the numbers in terms of the out amount of information that's being generated, not just in healthcare, but just in general, it, there's an eye-watering expansion in how much information is being collected uh, and it's growing at an exponential rate. And, and what's interesting is about 30% of the annual data um, that is generated globally is thought to relate in one way, shape or form to health. And that's not necessarily directly collected by healthcare organisations, but it is still related to health. And so there is this massive pool and growing pool of information on which we should be able to pull in order to generate insight and potentially improve the way that we deliver healthcare services. But it's not just about the volume, there's also massive growth in the complexity of the information that uh, we're collecting. So we've got things like structured data, which are relatively easy to analyze, but we've also got things such as imaging, digital histopathology, genomics, molecular testing, free text, and actually capitalizing on all this information that we collect can be a real challenge. Um, and this is a challenge that's not just an issue for healthcare organisations, but is seemingly particularly difficult for healthcare organisations. There are particular challenges, obviously, with the healthcare data around the legal and ethical use of the information. There's issues with data fragmentation between things like different care providers, uh, whether or not that's primary and secondary care or social care. 
there's issues to do with data quality, with missing data. But then we also have problems in as much as it's an area that is often not well invested in. We don't necessarily have huge groups of people who have the necessary skills to make best use of this information. Um, and there aren't necessarily easy access to tools available for people to be able to make use of this information. And so um, there are lots of organizations across the UK that try to standardize some of this stuff uh, and collect national data sets. Um, and so uh, where I work in Leeds, we, from a cancer perspective, end up submitting data to uh, what was previously Public Health England that forms part of a national cancer data set. And the idea is that they create a curated and central data set uh, on which kind of public health analytics can be done and information can be produced. And although they do produce reports, this central curation exercise takes time. Um, and so although there is some information that's available online, when I went online to um, the National Cancer Registration and Analytics Services website and pulled this off, uh, there is you know, some interactivity that is there, but it's limited in terms of its functionality. But probably more crucially, if you look at the top, you can see how old the data is. It's from 2018. And so a lot of the problem that we have is about the timeliness of data. And I think that what's been covered quite extensively, uh, you know, is the need during the COVID-19 pandemic to have timely access to information. And as it stands at the moment for our cancer data and really for any type of clinical data, in most hospitals, that's simply not available. There is just no access to up-to-date information. And this causes a number of problems. Number one, you don't have access to the information that you need when you want it. But also, if you're trying to encourage you know, best practice in terms of um, clinical end users actually inputting information, there's no real incentive for them because it's like a giant black hole. You put information in and you don't get anything out. So aside from for direct patient care, you know, filling in that extra structured drop down box on your electronic healthcare record seems a bit pointless. So we wanted to try and do something about this. Uh, and because I work in the area of oncology, this is where we focused our attention. And we started to build stuff using our markdown and using Shiny. Um, and uh, I'm sure all of you are fairly familiar with these, particularly given the talks that you've had this morning. But we decided that we wanted to try and use a combination of these things to try and address uh, some of the issues that we were having locally. And so we developed a tool that we called Augur. Um, and we had we set out a number of requirements up front. We wanted something that was flexible, that allowed people to be able to actually you know, get the information out that they wanted. We wanted it to have up to date information and try and use uh, you know, actually uh, information that was recent. We wanted it not just to be for the use of healthcare professionals, but also other people who work in hospitals. So hospital managers um, who might also want information, but have slightly different information needs. But we also wanted to build something that wasn't just suitable for one hospital, but that would potentially be useful across multiple organizations and potentially even nationally. And we also wanted this to be a kind of showcase of the art of the possible, uh, particularly locally to key decision makers. Um, so although it was built with cancer in mind, we're always keen to try and um, sort of highlight the fact that this could be used in any clinical area uh, with some adaptation. But we also wanted to make sure that whatever we built was actually going to be useful and people were going to make use of it. So what we ended up doing is we had a panel of um, healthcare professionals who were going to be end users and a panel of managers. And we actually did structured interviews to find out what it was that they wanted and what their information needs were. And then we built the design around what it was that they wanted and what they were going to use it for. We wanted to make sure it was using only nationally collated, uh, collected data items. And this was from the view of you know, potentially scaling up to other organizations in future we need to make sure that we're using data that all hospitals are already collecting so that this isn't going to be a big ask if people wanted to implement it. We wanted to use open source. Uh, we embedded end users within the development group and uh, we also involved patient representatives. Um, and so what I'm going to show you now is um, a video that just gives a bit of a flavor of essentially what we've been building. Um, I should say up front that this is showing using dummy data. Um, and so uh, some of the things will look a bit strange and won't look like the standard patterns you would expect, like on the survival curves, but it, it gives a, a, certainly a flavor. So um, the tool uh, essentially has tabs across the top that gives the different functionalities. And on the left hand side has all of the filters that allow you to select the patient population that you're interested in. 
there's a searchable bar which allows you to search either by ICD-10 or the name of the cancer and then you select your population and in this case we are selecting a uh, breast cancer population and you can select patient level characteristics such as gender and demographics uh, and then everything is updating itself as you change all of your filters on that sidebar. It also gives uh, tumor specific information so you can choose things like the grade, stage, morphology, molecular subtype, genetic tests, all of that is available and where the uh, uh, can be used to filter. Uh, and what this then gives you is it then gives you essentially these four areas, one of which is a survival curve, one of which gives you your population distribution where it's got the raw cancer population in totality shown, but grayed out of those that you've excluded based on the patient level characteristics. It gives key survival metrics in a table, and then it also has information on patient numbers, which is um, kind of interactive and searchable. We've also got this area on the right hand side, which allows you to then stratify. So you can split up by particular characteristics. So here we split by gender and you can see that's then split the survival curve, but it's also split the metrics that were in the table. So one of the other things that's of, uh, of massive interest to most hospitals, both clinicians and managers is waiting times and particular cancer waiting time targets. So we took information that was being collected about cancer waiting times and we created interactive plotly plots um, so you can select this is by MDT. So this is the team essentially that the, uh, are going to be managing the particular referral and it allows you to select a particular time period. Um, and then it gives you information about patient numbers, waiting times, uh, how many patients we've had as referrals. Um, and so those are kind of key information. Uh, now, Interestingly, one of the things that we were asked to produce was something about patient numbers, but the information that we were asked for from clinicians and from managers was subtly different. Managers were asking about information for Freedom of Information Act request, and clinicians were interested in um, trial feasibility, so knowing how many patients they had going through the hospital that were in a particular group. But the problem was, how did we build something that was flexible to be able to ask of the data whatever question that you wanted? And so we created this population explorer and the idea is that you select a cancer population so here again we've selected the c50 population breast cancer um, and then what you can do is you can sequentially add filters so the circle in the middle is the total population and then each filter that you add essentially breaks down that initial circle into arcs and then each subsequent filter then sub kind of splits each subsequent uh, each of the previous arcs again um, and again the pro the plot itself is interactive so you can then hover over the plot and get out the information that you want in terms of the proportion of the population, but also the number of patients. So this enabled us to be able to do both trial feasibility and also allow managers to be able to extract information for Freedom of Information Act requests. We have subsequent to this video actually been taken, it introduced also um, date filters, because obviously if you want trial feasibility, you need to know what time period these patients were seen over. Um, but this was a way of trying to solve two problems but with one tool and you can put any order and just kind of drag them about or change them um, and this was the way that we chose to try and tackle this particular issue without having lots of different things for different people we've got a bit of a placeholder with information on interactive geospatial mapping uh, and that's really going to be useful hopefully as it starts we start to get adoption more widely across yorkshire and then we've introduced information also about treatment so this is looking at overlap of treatment and so we've strayed away from using Venn diagrams, which uh, are not a great way of sharing information. And we're using this is the upset uh, plot. Uh, this is a great package called upset R and it allows you to look at overlaps. Um, so there's also the capability of being able to save the state of the app so that you can then reload it back in. Or you can also share stuff via a bookmark. And the idea here was to be able to enable people to be able to collaborate more easily so that if clinicians or managers found something that was of interest, they could then easily share it. We've had further meetings with our end users. And one of the things that they then highlighted was that they wanted information um, in the oncology space about 30 day mortality. So we also have built this functionality in. So this is looking at 30 day within 30 days or within a time period after receiving a, an oncological treatment, how many people or what proportion of patients are, are, are dying uh, because most cancer treatments take two to three months really to realize some effect. So if you're treating people and they're dying within 30 days, you're giving people all the toxicity without any of the benefit. So again, you can kind of get extra information and you can break down your treatment by its particular intent. 
So we're looking at whether or not it was being given as an adjunct to another treatment, whether or not it was given as curative treatment or whether or not it was for palliation. Um, and again, allows information to be filtered in terms of the patient population on the left hand side, much like the survival information that was shown before. Uh, and then we've also got the ability to change the, the dates as well. Um, so we've also then gone on to build further functionality in terms of admissions. So this essentially allows you to look at admissions on the different specialties within a certain number of days of uh, receiving an oncological treatment. Uh, oncology is predominantly an outpatient specialty and we want to try and avoid people coming into hospital. But this allows us to take a look at you know, whether or not we're doing things to patients that essentially means that um, we're causing them to come into hospital and whether or not there might be certain populations that seem to be more at risk of that and allows people to then make decisions as to whether or not we need to be managing their follow-up etc differently in order to try and mitigate for some of that risk. We've also tried to do some stuff with static documents so this is um, some basic interactivity in an R markdown document. Uh, the idea behind this is that it will be generated on a weekly basis and then emailed out to people uh, again, the, uh, this can be deployed in a way that the um, emailing out is actually done in an automated way um, using um, our Studio Connect. So it means that you know it can just automatically regenerate itself. And it's got a navigation bar on the left, which allows you to um, look by MDT. And then it allows you to look at information about the number of referrals, waiting times, et cetera, how many people have breached in a given week. At the moment, although in our trust, we do get information about two week wait reports, it's not necessarily the most timely information. And the problem is you want it immediately. You don't want it three weeks later because it becomes a bit difficult to try and actually resolve the issues if you've got people who are waiting. Uh, it's been sol kind of solved but three weeks ago, but the actual underlying problem is not yet addressed. So the, the app in its current form is built. We are working in collaboration with um, the Yorkshire and Humber Locally Integrated Healthcare Record Exemplar. Um, which is um, a kind of regional health record, which has a um, population health piece and a cloud environment to actually deploy this. And we're in the process of getting this up and running for clinicians and managers in uh, the Yorkshire and Humber region. We've had some initial conversations with various partners who are potentially interested in making use of this or a version of this for their own purposes locally. Uh, we're continuing to try and add functionality based on what people want. We're expanding the pool of automated reports that is pulled off this particular data set. But we're also interested in finding collaborators within other disease areas to be able to build similar things, but for other conditions um, in order to try and uh, kind of make best use of that information. I think the key thing really is that we want to try and make information more readily available and also make people see the value of that information. And that has two benefits. It allows people to actually derive value, but also it, it provides an encouragement for people to actually start caring a bit more about the data that they're putting into electronic health records, which then ends up helping everybody in the long run. Um, and definitely is something that we're keen to try and find more ways of improving on. Um, so um, we are very happy to talk to anybody about any of this. So if anyone is interested, please do feel free to email me. Um, this work has been supported by funding from the Health Foundation, so we're very grateful to them and obviously also grateful to the patient on, patients on whose data these sorts of projects rely. Uh, happy to take any questions that anyone may have, uh, either from a practical or technical perspective. Yes, a few questions in the chat, thanks. So the first uh, question is a simple one. Is it open source and can you share the code? Okay, share the link to the code. Uh, so it it, 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 is, it will be open source. We haven't yet got to the point where we've actually shared it through GitHub repository, but very easy for us to do so. So if anyone's interested, please let me know and we can always add you. We've got a GitHub repository at the moment, but it's currently not open. It's just uh, closed, but uh, we're hoping to sort that out. That's just more uh, we haven't got around to it rather than anything else. Yes. Well, uh, yeah, I, I will. I promise you I will come and read it as a minimum. And there's certainly people in the chat who will too. Uh, another question is, did you consider, no, I keep, the chat keeps moving. Did you consider splitting it into multiple apps based on target audience? So we we did, uh, but what was interesting is, so that was initially what we were going to do. But one of the conversations that we had with some of our user groups was the fact that there was massive overlap between the functionality that particularly senior clinicians wanted and managers wanted. And so there was, it, it, when we tried to segment it out, we were gonna have to make so many different apps to meet different users that we thought that it was just going to be too complicated, both from a 
end user perspective, but also from a development point of view. And we just kept it all as one. Um, it was based predominantly on the feedback from the people that we spoke to. Thank you very much. Another question is, uh, I keep losing them. Where is it? Um, oh yeah, what's the expectation on time to develop something like this? So what I would say is that actually developing this so that it, it was just working didn't actually take that long. Um, so so I'm, I'm a, a, an R user for analytics. I'd never built a Shiny app and I built the first version of this, which had all of the survival stuff in, in a couple of evenings. It didn't actually take very long. Making it slick and glossy takes ages. Uh, is the way I would put it. So I think if you want something that looks fairly rudimentary and it has the functionality, it's not too bad. If you want something that looks a bit flashier, I think that that's the bit that ends up taking a bit more time. Yeah, it's the the eight to twenty rule. I think applies in dashboards as yeah. in life. Um, there's another question that everyone's very keen on the chat. I didn't, I wasn't particularly sure it was to you, but let's just ask you anyway and see what you say. So the question yeah. is, I'd love to know from a structural point of view where in organisations people sit who do this sort of work. <laughs> uh, well, so uh, that's a great question. Uh, I mean, I, I personally think that um, there is a, a big problem with how um, reports are generated in hospitals. Certainly within the trust I work in, we have an enormous number of people who work producing standard monthly reports and they essentially use Excel manually typing stuff in and it's woefully inefficient. And it would make more sense to start upskilling these people in order to be able to produce something in Markdown, which is reproducible, or to produce uh, dashboards in order to try and actually make things more efficient. As it stands at the moment, it's essentially me and maybe some other academics doing this evenings, weekends, and maybe cobbling together a bit of funding to get some extra support. There is no department that would deliver this at present. Um, you know, but I think it takes a very different attitude towards how this stuff needs to be developed because it, the time investment is upfront and then hopefully you don't really have to do it again. There might be a small amount of maintenance, but once you've done it, you've done it. Uh, whereas at the moment, it's very much how long does it take you to produce the one report? How many reports are you producing? And I think it takes a bit of a mentality shift in order for an organization to start adopting this sort of approach. Yes, indeed. I feel like this question would be a great paper for next conference. I just, if anybody wants to tackle that issue, I think it is a, it's an excellent one. Right. I'm going to go to break now. Thank, so thank you very much for your talk. We are back at uh, 12.25. So I will see everyone then. You can stop sharing now, Kieran.
Right, we're back. Hopefully everyone's back from fetching their cup of tea. Uh, Freud's still here. So uh, we have now um, Heather Turner from Our Ladies and an EPSRC uh, Research Software Engineering Fellow talking about su supporting equality, diversity and inclusion in the R community. Heather, please. Thank you. Thanks very much. Yeah, as part of my fellowship, I'm, I'm working to support um, sustainability and equality, diversity and inclusion in the R project. Uh, so I'm happy to talk today about all the activity that's going on to support EDI in the R community. Uh, so let's, I don't know, uh, let's think a bit about uh, diversity in, in, the, in the R community then. Um, as uh, nobody needs a license for R, there's no register of our users. It could be a bit difficult to get um, data on the R community as a whole. Um, but one population that's quite well defined is the population of uh, people that maintain packages on CRAN. Um, and they've been surveyed uh, a few times over the years by different researchers and fairly recently by uh, Pinto et al in uh, 2017. And in that their survey, they found that um, 88% of the respondents identified as men. And uh, we see a similar uh, pattern in the in the community at, at large. As I say, that's difficult to survey, but uh, the R Consortium and, the, and R Studio have both done large uh, user surveys with, with thousands of respondents. And in both cases, uh, they found that uh, around 80% or more than 80% of, of respondents uh, also identified as men. So I think it's fair to say that uh, that men are overrepresented in in the both the user and the developer R community. Uh, Pinto and et al also looked at uh, geographical diversity, and here we can see that uh, the majority of uh, packages are maintained by people in Europe and North America. Um, Oceania is also overrepresented; it's just four percent there, but the it's uh, Oceana is only 0.5% of the world population. Um, so we see a, a sort of general uh, Western or global North bias uh, that we see in a lot of uh, open science and um, endeavors. Uh, so these are just a couple of indicators in case you needed them, um, that uh, the R community isn't perhaps as diverse as, as we would like it to be. We would like everybody to enjoy the benefits of R and um, but the good news is that there's a, a lot of activity going on in the community uh, to uh, support and um, encourage participation of people from underrepresented or historically um, marginalized groups. So um, I'm going to spend the rest of my talk uh, focusing on, on those activities. Um, starting with, with our ladies is perhaps uh, the most well known. Um, so this is a, a worldwide um, organization that, that is trying to promote uh, gender diversity in the, in the art community. And uh, they're mainly organized through local chapters that have uh, meetups, um, would normally be in person when, when we're not uh, facing a pandemic. Um, and there, there are 10 local chapters in the UK. So if you, if you haven't uh, looked, you might want to see if there's one in a city near where you are. Uh, for people that don't have a, a chapter near them, there's also a, a remote chapter that uh, hasn't been so active lately because everybody's been doing things online, but um, uh, sort of previously has had uh, various online activities for people that, that can't go to, go to local events or, or don't have local events near them. Our ladies also do a number of initiatives to sort of promote uh, women in the R community, such as uh, the, the R Ladies directory, where you can, you can look up to find out perhaps uh, potential speakers for your event. Um, and a, a Slack for our ladies worldwide to network and uh, communicate with each other to help each other out on, on R problems and so on. They also offer a, a abstract review service, which is very useful if you're thinking of uh, submitting an abstract for any R conference. Um, and uh, they're very active on Twitter. There's, uh, I mentioned here, just the R Ladies Global account um, and the We Are R Ladies, which is a curated, um, a, a rotating curator. Different R Ladies take it on in different weeks and, and sort of share about their work and their use of R. And you can find out more on, on rladies.org. 
So there's currently 216 chapters. Uh, Our Lady started in, in 2012 with just, just one chapter, and uh, there were a couple of other chapters started around the world. Um, but Our Lady's Global uh, was organized in, in 2016, and that was the start of a, a large and, and steady growth in, in chapters around the world, uh, as you can see on this plot, up to the 216 uh, active today. And it's nice to see that it's still been growing despite the challenges of the, of the pandemic. Uh, this has required a lot of effort, so I wanted to show you some of the people behind it. Uh, so this is the Our Ladies Global team, currently led by Claudia Vitolo, Erin Liddell and Hannah Frick. And I won't name everybody else, but uh, there's another 16 ladies there on the on the global team from, from around the world that uh, help with onboarding uh, leaders of new chapters, mentoring, running the blog, the social media and so on. So it takes a lot of activity. And, so I wanted to, to show who was behind the scenes. It's interesting to compare the Our Ladies groups to uh, the Our User groups. So if you look on Meetup, where a lot of uh, groups organise, uh, there are a lot many, uh, a lot more uh, Our User groups. So 858 compared to the 200 or so Our Ladies groups. Um, one thing that's interesting to see, though, is that Our Ladies has been uh, particularly strong in, in Latin America with, with help from the leadership of that, that global team. And uh, so they're not only helping to address the, the gender diversity, but also the geographical diversity um, that, that we saw at the beginning. Uh, so you may have heard of Our Ladies, but have you heard of Our Girls School? This is a very new initiative um, that's read by, uh, led by an independent Islamic uh, school in, in Birmingham in the UK. And uh, they've started developing our markdown based lessons to uh, use with girls from ages 11 to 16 in their school. And um, I like this feedback that they shared on, on their Twitter account. First, our lesson, I loved it. So they're having quite good success there and they're very happy to um, connect with anybody that's working with, with school age children, particularly girls um, from around the world, uh, whether as a teacher or somebody running after school clubs. Um, so, um, that's what I had to, their, their Twitter account on that slide, so I'll have to update my slides. But they, they have a Twitter account where you can connect with them. Uh, so going back to the geographical diversity, there have been a number of um, uh, initiatives that have sprung up in the recent years. Uh, so Latin R is a conference that started in 2018 as a satellite conference to a computing conference in Argentina with just around 100 attendees, I think. and. Uh, They've, they've really grown and this year they're online and they've got nearly a, a thousand attendees from across Latin America. Um, so they've been running this annual conference and they have a slack to sort of keep in contact in between conferences uh, so that participants can, can continue to network. Africa R started in about 2019 and their focus is more on supporting the establishment of new user groups and also working together, for example, to run Saturday conferences. Asia R is so new, it doesn't have an official logo yet, so I, I just made this up. Um, but it's an initiative that started through an incubator at USR 2021. And they are planning to uh, create, or beginning to create, a network a little, by, a little bit like Africa R to support new user groups, promote lo local conferences. They already have some, uh, for example, Japan R, the Korea R conference. And they're starting to think about having a, a joint uh, Asia R conference. Um, in a couple of years. Uh, so if you're interested in that, perhaps you've got connections to Asia, you know, do, do join the Slack, which is linked on, on my slides. Uh, so here are the leaders behind there. I, I show there um, the uh, chairs of the recent Latin R conference and um, the Africa R leaders that have been um, gathered or they were sort of selected to represent different parts of Africa. So East, West, North and South. Um, uh, French speaking, English speaking, to try and, um, you know, connect across Africa as, as well as possible. And, uh, and then at the bottom there, we have the people that are uh, founded the Asia R network, Janani Ravi and Aditya Apatha. And um, so they're a great team of people doing a, a lot of work um, to, to help 
uh, spread R and encourage our users in areas where there hasn't traditionally been such a good uh, network or support. Uh, so going beyond uh, gender diversity or geographical diversity, uh, there are many other reasons why people might identify as um, being part of a marginalized or underrepresented group, perhaps of, because of disability or race or sexual orientation, uh, for whatever reason, and uh, my our community is is there for you. Uh, they also have a community Slack uh, for people to gather, find community, find other people with similar experience to them. Um, they have a blog, and uh, rather than running chapters like Our Ladies, they focus on online activities such as webinars and tutorials, and they've also been supporting a lot of people to get our Studio Instructor certification. Um, so again, you can connect with them on uh, Twitter or on their website. Uh, Minorities in R was founded by Daniel Smalls Perkins and Doris Scott, and uh, they've built up a team um, of supporters, including Sylvia Canelon, Liz Hare, Audris Campbell, Andy Mirtha, Minakshi Kushwaha, and Ola Giwa. So, um, so there's a lot that we can all learn, uh, even if we don't necessarily identify as part of a minority group. Uh, Forwards is a, as an R Foundation task force. So R Foundation is a not-for-profit organization that supports the R project. And uh, the, the objective of this task force is particularly to uh, think how to widen participation in R Foundation related activities, uh, such as the Use R Conference, the R Journal, and uh, contributions to, to uh, CRAN, and, and the R project itself. And uh, the task force is organized in a number of sub teams that focus on different aspects, such as accessibility, community, conferences, on ramps, which by that we mean sort of on ramping users to become uh, developers, and uh, surveys that we often run at the Use R conference, and teaching. Uh, for example, uh, we've developed some. Uh, modules for uh, learning to develop packages uh, that we've run online and um, also uh, hoping to work in collaboration with local groups so that they can uh, run it in say our ladies groups or our user groups. So here's, here's the forwards team that, that I'm a part of. We have a couple of people that sort of lead each sub team and, uh, and then a number of uh, other people that I couldn't I couldn't fit all on the slide um, supporting supporting this work. And finally, I'd like to talk about the the R contribution working group. Um, so the the aim here is um, to uh, foster a larger and more diverse community of contributions to R itself. Um, so you might think, well, this sounds very technical and and probably only for uh, very highly skilled statistics or, or computing professors, uh, but actually there's a, there's a whole range of ways that people can contribute to our development, um, starting from uh, reporting a bug, for example. Uh, one way that uh, our core, the our core developers uh, really appreciate people helping out is um, doing some initial triage of bugs, for example, just confirming that they get uh, that that you get the same. A result and, the, and it really is a bug uh, on your on your computer and not just something specific to the bug reporter's situation or a misunderstanding of the documentation or whatever. And uh, obviously, then there's a, there's a range of um, uh, contributions from from small fixes to much larger fixes, um, requiring a range of, of technical expertise and perhaps things that maybe you wouldn't have thought of, such as um, contributing translations for messages. Um, so R can be localized in a, a number of languages and it supports a, a number of um, uh, language languages at the moment. It would like to support more languages. Um, so this is another way that, that people can, can help if they have uh, uh, fluency in a, a language other than English. Um, so what has this group done, been done so far? So it was set up after USR 2020 um, and 
uh, a site has been created that at the moment is just a subsite of the forwards website and hopefully will be, become uh, have a more official R project link fairly soon. Um, we've also set up a Slack group because Slack's uh, quite popular in our community. So this is um, to support people who are interested in, in our development and give a, a, a place to have more informal chats compared to say the RDevel mailing list. Um, we've uh, developed a, 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 an R development guide to try and um, you know, have a more user-friendly documentation on R. And we uh, organized two contributor tutorials that use R that are now available on YouTube and the materials online for, for anybody to go through at their, at their own pace. Um, and we hope to build on this to have sort of more events um, to support new contributors uh, to get started, because that's often the biggest challenge, sort of knowing where to start and, and what to do. And uh, here are some of the participants um, that have got involved in, in this working group. So it's included people from, from Forwards, from Our Ladies, from MyR, from Our Core, uh, from the general R community. So we're trying to involve people across the community um, uh, to work together, you know, to to um, to reach as, as 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 many people as possible. So, for example, Sarangi Kaur has been working on the R development guide. Luis Mavila Sancho has been sort of doing analysis of, of R's bugzilla, which is where they track um, the bugs. Um, Michael Chirico and Michael Lawrence. Um, Michael Lawrence is an R core member. They they wrote the translations tutorial. Kara Wu has been um, helping to sort of report back to our ladies and our weekly and Gwyn Sturdivant has been doing a similar thing for my R and Gabrielle Becker and Martin Mechler, Martin Mechler again an R core member, um, developed the contributing to our tutorials. So you can see it's quite a range of people that have got involved and if anybody's interested you're quite welcome just to join in the meetings or to see what we've been doing. Um, we try and work openly on, on the GitHub via issues um, so that people can see what we're thinking about, what we're trying to do next. Um, I pre appreciate your, your input. Um, so how can you get involved? Um, throughout I've sort of tried to share links to the websites and Twitter and so on. So Twitter is a great way to stay informed yourself but also to share opportunities with others. It's quite easy to, to retweet isn't it? Um, but if Twitter isn't for you then a lot of these uh, communities do have blogs where they, they share what they're up to. Um, and you can you can visit their websites Oops, sorry. Um, to uh, um, to find out how to join join the slacks and so on. The only one that isn't on the website is the Asia R because it's so new. But you, you can find the link in my, in my slides, which are online. Um, uh, yeah, one way that you might consider um, contributing is to offer us to speak as a our ladies group or an our user group. Um, I know it takes time, but there's some, been some great talks at this conference. So maybe if you think it would be of interest to a wider um, audience, perhaps reusing your NHS R talk would be an idea. And if you're not sure who to offer it to, but you'd like to do that, you know, feel free to get in touch and we'll see if we can match you to a group. Um, and make sure uh, your colleagues and friends know, know what's out there. I think there's a, a lot going on and maybe not everybody's aware. And, um, you know, it'd be great to connect people to these initiatives where they would either find them help them, helpful for themselves or find them a, a great way to contribute back to the to the R community. So I hope this is uh, um, giving you some inspiration to uh, uh, of how you might be able to support equality, diversity and inclusion in the R project and how we can all work together to make it a welcoming place. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm not seeing any questions in the chat. I have a question. Uh, I'm just wondering uh, how this work compares with some of the work going on in other communities we might be members of. So I'm just thinking about things like maybe like Python or SQL or other kind of technology type communities. Um, well, the communities do get a lot of inspiration from each other. You know, so there's, we're often looking to see what uh, PyLate is, is doing or what uh, the Python community is doing themselves just to sort of encourage new contributors, for example. Uh, so we do we do learn from each other. 
and we have sometimes sort of <coughs> invited people with experience from another com community to, to talk with us and uh, so, so that we can learn from each other. Um, there's, there's probably more we could do to work together. Great. Thank you very much. I'll move us on now. So next we have um, Adam Watkins, an advanced improvement analyst, who will be talking about mapping public transport travel times, building on enabling the work of others. I must say I'm very excited already because this has been a hard unsolved problem in my team for a long time. So please take it away. Uh, good afternoon, Prinham Dar. I'm just trying to get my presentation up at full screen. Is that working for everyone, Chris? Yeah, looks good. Cool. Um, hi. I'm Adam Watkins. I'm just going to give a brief introduction to um, who I am and try and put that in some sort of context. So I am one of seven analysts in the Improvement Cymru analysis team. Uh, one of the other analysts is Jess Pang, who presented on Monday. And I feel I should echo a comment she's made in the chat, which is that we are roughly split between uh, men and women 50-50. We're part of this organisation called Improvement Cymru, which is the National Service Improvement Body for Wales. Um, and we sit within Public Health Wales alongside um, a lot of other teams, including colleagues from the observatory who presented earlier today. Uh, and we're part of the NHS in Wales that we just call NHS Wales. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time trying to convince you that it is important to be able to look at both driving and public transport travel times. Although I would note that obviously um, by not looking at public transport accessibility to services, you're often in directly discriminating against people on a whole range of um, characteristics. You're probably discriminating against women, probably discriminating against people um, from different ethnicities, um, and you're almost certainly discriminating against people from poorer communities or with less wealth or, or lower incomes. Um, I note that it's relatively easy to look at drive times, um, and actually the NHSR community has a really good blog on being able to do that. And just to sort of Put some sort of sense of scale here we reckon that something like 20 percent of people with diabetes in wales live in a household without access to a car and i suppose the one other thing that i would note just looking at this slide now is that already you can see that maybe driving in public transport cashments are very different so thinking about that when you're inviting people to appointments and things like that is quite important but there are existing tools to try and look at travel times by public transport so there's a bunch of sort of commercial offerings at the top there and broad reason for not using those is that they are very expensive and often it's unclear how expensive they're going to be. And the other thing is there have been a couple of attempts to sort of crack this in recent years. So uh, Open Data Institute Lees, which I think has been renamed now, I can't remember what two, apologies, um, produced something called OTP for GB. The ONS Data Campus produced something called Graphi, which was actually used to inform the Welsh Index of Multiple Deprivation here. But there's some dependency issues there. So for example, OTP for GB has a dependency on the whole sort of set of Microsoft development um, stuff which makes it harder to deploy elsewhere um, and there are maintenance issues often these things tended to be produced once um, and then sort of used for a particular project and then left and there have been recent developments in months that I, I will talk through but I should note both of those were, were major inspirations. I should also note that there are sort of um, existing projects with particular specific purposes and scope so this is something produced by the Institute for Transport Studies in Leeds that will come up again um, looking at like 15 minute isochrones for different modes of travel for every lower super output area in, I think, in England at the moment. Um, and you can download those and you can use those for certain types of accessibility. But obviously, that's a very specific use. Um, lower super output areas will also come up quite soon. So, dropping back a little bit, we can try and think about well, what do we actually want if you want to be able to make travel time analysis more accessible for more people? And the sort of product that I ended up sort of having in mind was what you really want is a table of travel times from every place in Wales to every other place um, at different times of day, because obviously public transport accessibility varies over times of day and you've got to wait at either end of things like that. Um, I want to say thank you to the Welsh Modelling Collaborative for helping scope analyst needs there at Hackathon to sort of talk through what other analysts might want from this. Um, so that's, that's really what I'm aiming at throughout the rest of this presentation. So. How do we get there? Um, and I ended up sort of thinking, well, it's really three different tasks that you've got to do. You've got to determine a geographic unit of analysis. What do we mean by place? If you want to look at every place in Wales or every other place, um, you've got to look at setting up a journey planner. So that's bringing together data, timetables, and a piece of software to make sense of those. And then you've got to run those two things together to produce travel time matrices. But let's look at the first one of those. What you quickly end up maybe come to the conclusion around is that the ONS um, statistical geographies, which are things like lower super out areas, medium super out areas, 
are probably the place, the thing to pick on if you want to try and link travel time work to demographics um, and existing public data outputs and so on. Uh, and in Wales, there are fewer than 2,000 lower super output areas, um, jumps up to maybe 2,600 once you start thinking about the places over the border. So a lot of Welsh people in mid Wales have to go to hospitals like Hereford and Shrewsbury. And the only way that you get from South Wales to North Wales by train is through England. So you have to include at least that side of England for like the public transport aspect of it. Uh, I note that some other places have produced MSOA matrices, so ODI leads have um, done that with some of the work. That's what uh, the OTP for GB project was. Um, the one other thing I pick up here is that importantly, more than anything, if you want to try and marry up like epidemiological data um, and rough estimates, then and then whether or not people are going to use public transport or try to, then the census 2011 outputs and hopefully soon the census 2021 outputs on access to car by age and gender is available at LSOA level and be helpful for that. Still a little bit more work to do. Once you've decided you want to use LSOAs, you actually have to work out at each point in the lower super output area where a journey is going to start and end. Um, and the upfield that is, well, you, you try and find the population more way to the centroid, but in rural LSOAs, that could be right in the middle of nowhere between three different villages. So the next thing I try and do is find the nearest place. And again, place is sort of a bit hand wavy here, but um, this is like central of a village, uh, train station, pub, it can fall back to in some cases. Uh, and that's using open street map data. So the first part is from the ONS, provide population weighted centroids for each of their geographies. And I use open street map data to find like a nearest actual location where people might be or want to go. And then I find the nearest road to that and say, okay, that's where all the journey is going to start and end. So sorted the first thing. We sorted what are we going to mean by place? How are we going to actually think about origins and destinations um, in Wales and a little bit beyond? So the next challenge is this setting up of a journey planner. Um, I'm not going to talk through the timetable formats in detail, but the main thing that you've got to do here is think about converting these top two ones, uh, the red and yellow ones, to the grey one. Uh, the grey one is what most tools will consume. The red and yellow ones are ones that, um, at least for most of the last 20 years, timetables have been produced in, in Britain. Uh, this is just a picture of a big computer that I wanted to put in, but it's also relevant to thinking about actually how some of these timetable formats have evolved. So the red timetable format for rail is mostly designed for machines that look like this. And I think Saturn either Andover or Swindon, that sort of thing in the late eighties. Um, and the format reflects that in the way that it's designed. So how do you go from those red and yellow formats to the gray format? Well, one answer that serves um, England mostly for buses at least is this so in the last couple of years the department for transport in westminster has been building out this thing called the bus open data service which actually takes gray data directly from bus companies um, and so you can put that directly into popular free software for doing transport planning and they've also retained this commercial partner called ito world who will take trans exchange data from the other three countries of the united apologies other two countries of Great Britain, there is a weirdness about Northern Ireland that will come up later, but essentially they take English data directly from bus companies in England um, in the grey format, and then they take the yellow data that is already being put out in Wales and Scotland and for other modes of transport. But what that produces at the end, this grey integrated trans transit model, doesn't include heavy rail, so what we mostly think about in terms of like going to a train station and getting on a train, um, and when I first started this, which was back in sort of June, July 2021, there were some significant issues outside of England that I was struggling to get resolved. Um, I've since managed to actually get in contact with ITO World and they are now fixed. Um, I'm hoping to have sort of an ongoing working relationship with them to some extent. But the other choice and the choice that gives you a bit more control over the process and most importantly deals with heavy rail is UK to GTFS. So this is a package produced by the Institute for Transport Studies and the University of Leeds. Uh, and that takes those two formats and it spits it out in that grey DTFS format. Um, and once you've got it in that grey format, it's also a lot easier to start doing your own manipulations on, which might come in handy if you're thinking about like looking at a subset of the data, um, or if you're thinking about adding your own like hypothetical journeys, if you're thinking about like how timetables might change in the near future. However, when I first started using UKG GTFS, started to identify a bunch of issues in it. Um, so 
issues in some cases that wouldn't have really mattered for the sorts of things that the Institute of Transport Studies and Leeds was using them for. So it's this thing that as, as we sort of extended the use of the package, um, we found things that work in different places um, differently. Um, and by having that sort of broader range of users and that community building up around the package, I mean, hopefully this will become something that's more reliable and serves a sort of greater range of ends. So all of these issues, um, I reported and I either fixed them or mostly Dr. Malcolm Morgan at the Institute of Transport Study in Leeds fixed. Um, I've put here a link to the GitHub repository and I did so for the lower super out area trip points calculation as well. I've tried to do that throughout the presentation, but you can go on there and you can look on the issue log. You can look at um, the timetables that identified these issues using um, and you can look at how we talked about fixing them and actually then committing those fixes back to the um, the UK to GTFS repository. The one other thing that I should really mention here is a lot of these issues I found by checking against uh, Travel Line, um, who are this slightly old organisation that pulled together public transport data from across Great Britain's local authorities um, and make that available in an open data format and with their own journey planner. They gave me access to the API for their own journey planner for a, not not the millions of journeys that I needed to plan, but enough that I could start running some automated checks for a small set of journeys. And that helped start finding areas where the results I was getting were different to the ones that they were producing. And that helped narrow down and find particular issues. So I think that's like a really neat example of collaboration between different organizations to actually find and improve something for multiple people. So fixed up UK GTFS, we now have timetable data in the right format. And the question then becomes, or what tools are there to use and what ones should we use? And the two big choices um, are Open Trip Planner, uh, which is something that's increasingly used to actually just drive um, people's own public facing trip planning websites. And then there's a package that has only appeared in the last few months really called R5R. Um, and this is built around um, the library of a company called Conveil, who offer a lot of sort of commercial services for planning and looking at changes to public transport timetables but they make their core library R5 publicly available. So what um, this institute in Brazil has done is they've taken that and they've put an R wrap around that and it is, is fantastic for generating much larger travel time matrices. Open Trip Planner is increasingly less useful for sort of um, big analysis, um, but it's good enough for getting going with maybe a few hundred or a few thousand journeys. So it might actually be sourced for some purposes. So which one is it worth like trying to pick and support? And I think the answer is, well, both, really. Um, so what I ended up building was a sort of R package. Uh, it's very messily written, um, but this is sitting in a GitHub repository. And what this does is downloads timetables for, for you in the different formats from the different sources, runs them through UK to GTFS if necessary, downloads map data from OpenStreetMap, trims that to the region that I'm interested in, and it creates both an open trip planner um, file and an R5R file. Um, does some basic checks to make sure that like you can actually use those for plans and journeys. Um, and then it just creates a new GitHub release. Uh, just trying to think if there's anything else on that. Ah, well, I guess probably the most interesting thing for a lot of people is you could make this code work for any other part of Britain pretty easily. I think it would probably take you a, a couple of hours at the moment. I do want to make it even easier. I want it to be so that you give it a polygon works out which files it needs to download for your bit of Britain, um, and then trims it all in the same way. Just wanted to also note that all happens through a GitHub action. This runs every single Monday morning. Um, lots of neat things about GitHub actions in terms of it being able to run code in parallel, in terms of it being extremely reproducible. Uh, I'm in the process of begging um, us um, central bodies in NHS Wales to give us something like this that we can use internally and run our own sort of data pipelines on a scheduled reusable fashion. If anyone has any hints about how they've done that in their organization, um, particularly if they've tied that up with like these your uh, cloud structure, I'd be really interested to hear more about that. And the upshot is that there is a web page you can go to, you can download a zip file and in three minutes, you can get a copy of Open Trip Planner running with like the Welsh-ish Wales data. It will work on Windows, Mac or Linux if you've got the right version of Java installed. And there are a bunch of our libraries to talk to Open Trip Planner. Or um, in about 50 lines of code, you can do the same thing for the R5R thing and start doing massive um, travel time matrices. 
So this point, determine geographic units of analysis, lower super output areas. We've got two different journey planners running, one particularly suitable for generating millions of journeys. So the next step is really just hook those things together. Um, here is a very pretty diagram, if I do say so myself, although possibly not very instructive. Um, but I think the thing that is nice about it is that it shows like the reliance on open data on the left-hand side, and then the use of free software right in the middle to tie all that together. Uh, and again, GitHub Action uh, supporting like running multiple processes in parallel. This runs every Tuesday morning. So it, it looks at departures across the whole of a Tuesday, the next Tuesday every week, um, finds four different sort of arrive by travel time matrices by investigating all of that. There's a bit more work in each deal on like quantile based ones. So looking at like, if you set out at some point on a Tuesday, what's like the 80% the travel time that you would expect to have by the time you get to your destination. That's still a work in progress. And it is a bit tricky because you are looking at something like 16 million journeys times by 15 minute intervals over the course of a day. So I probably need to think a bit harder and be a little, little, little bit less lazy in terms of how I'm actually handling the data. And the outputs, those four different matrices, they look like this. Um, you've got travel time, you've got, sorry, lower super output area IDs um, as row and column names, uh, and then the travel time in minutes between them. One other thing I've noticed about these is I've stuck at the bottom a bunch of comments uh, to try and give you metadata. So if you, you find yourself coming back to a file several months later, you have some idea of what it's referring to, what the numbers and it actually mean. And it also embeds like the licensing information. So all the code for this is available online. Um, I'm afraid currently under my own personal GitHub repositories, which I'm, I'm happy to discuss why that's currently the case and how we're trying to move away from that in Improvement Cymru. Um, and all of the data, I believe I have understood the licensing conditions of all the stuff that goes into it correctly. That is also made available under the open database license, which is the same license as the open stream map data um, fundamentally. But you also need to be aware of attribution requirements like ordinate survey and ONS. Um, and I make these available using a sort of web-based viewer. So this is literally just digging into those CSV files, pulling them out using JavaScript and then showing them in leaflet. Uh, it's mostly just a demo and a place to download the matrices. I've been thinking it'd be useful to add some issues here so people can say like, no, my travel time doesn't look like this, it's wrong, fix it, or ideally report that you're actually using this to support another piece of analytical work. Uh, I think there's some useful learning in like feeding data and learning a little bit of JavaScript to drive stuff out because as people were mentioning in the chat, you end up with these problems like massive HTML files, um, particularly if you're using like multiple layers in Leaflet, I found any other sort of alternative suggestions. Um, would be nice. The one thing I would want to mention here is I really want to steal a form of map visualization called Data Shine. I put a link to that in the notes of the presentation, uh, which was done by a couple of geographers, I think about a decade ago, getting on for that. Um, and it's really neat at showing like where people are actually living. If you actually do any maps of Wales, what you've got is you've got two thin slivers where you've got two million people living in the south and a million people living along the top. And roughly the population of the Isle of Wight, so 120,000 people spread out in the middle. And if you've got that all coloured red, well, that's, that's accurate, but it might be more useful to show that actually there are only tiny parts of those rural areas where there are actually dwellings where people live. So that's it. That's the three things done. Um, but there are some major omissions. So accessibility is not very well handled. Um, and that's basic things at the moment, like actually the walking speed distance constraints not being very sensible. There are specific mobility issues around wheelchair access to different modes of transport. Pretty sure level boarding at train stations is terrible in Wales. Um, there are other specific accessibility issues. There are also some issues around like, at the moment doesn't look at travel costs, fares, or even if you think about it, another way of like um, attentional capacity, how many changes you've got to make and those sorts of things doesn't deal with reliability. Around 20% of buses are five minutes late or more in Wales, 20% of trains, three minutes late or more. If you've got multiple transfers, that can be a real pain in the neck. And almost certainly these are worse sometimes of the year than others. So yeah. Other emissions, uh, I won't talk through in detail. Uh, Northern Ireland is obviously a major emission if you work in Northern Ireland. Uh, happy to have that conversation outside of here. And I should note, it took me a little while, but I finally managed to find a way into having a sensible conversation with Transport for Wales about this. Um, in fairness, I think people at Transport for Wales and Travel Line Company both tried to help me, but didn't know quite where to go. But I'm hoping that we can have a bit more of a discussion about flexible bus services, um, about like what timetables are going to look like in two years, a bit more data on road speed, stuff like that. 
And the last couple of things I wanted to really quickly mention is try to think about other ways to lower the bar for geographic analysis and visualization. Um, started trying to work on this. I'd be really interested in talking some, to someone about this and whether it would be useful. And also, I'm afraid I shoved this slide on at the last minute um, because of the last few conversations that we've been having um, about we were trying to look at how do we deploy our shiny apps and improvement Cymru, uh, given like issues with maybe our shiny connect for the sort of use cases that we have. Um, and again, I'd be really happy to talk about like how could we build something that was actually a bit more reliable and usable like this, but this might be a useful proof of concept. So thank you. I hope I have stuck just within the 20 minutes there. Um, one more thing, I suppose, thinking about Heather's presentation and also thinking about the sort of pledge for the NHSR community. I think one thing that we need to do in Wales is engage more with the NHSR community and make sure that it represents like the four countries of the UK more fully. I think if you've got a package, for example, that's being produced and it's labeled as NHS something and it doesn't support all four countries of the UK, that's a bug. And we need to be doing something to try and help move that forward. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. Um, perfectly to time. Uh, everyone is going absolutely wild in the chat about how much they love this project. I think you definitely should submit an NHSR solutions application because I think we all want this. Everybody wants this. So please uh, contact us and we can possibly look at funding and helping and all that kind of thing that we exist to do. Uh, we're going to have just time for one quick question, which is, um, how do you validate travel times and selections of routes that people actually take? Um, with difficulty on the second, I think that's probably a bigger piece of work. Uh, I have some code which currently isn't in production use, which um, automatically tries to validate travel time, travel journeys against uh, travel lines planner. So I mentioned that they've given me access to that. I have some work on doing that on a more automated basis so that every week you would look at maybe 20, 50 journeys and check how am I getting similar results. Um, but I think it's also something that's coming up more as we do bits of site optimization work using this, which I'm already in the process of doing. Um, and as we use it to support conversations about like access to EDs, those sorts of things are coming out. So far, um, possibly just I'm scaring people or something, but no one has come back to me and said, no, that, that looks ridiculous or that looks very wrong. Um, maybe the conversations that we have with Transport for Wales might open up some of those issues a bit more. Great. Thank you very much. Fantastic talk. Right. That's now time for a break. We will be back with our international colleagues at uh, five past three. So until then, uh, adieu.
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the final afternoon of the NHSR Community Conference. I don't know about you, but I'm starting to get a little bit emotional that it's all ending. It's been such an epic um, three days. And I know that uh, I've really enjoyed all the talks, so much insightful stuff, so much brilliant work going off out there in the NHS. Just as a little side note, I'd like to invite you to give us a virtual round of applause to Charlotte, Jane, Anastasia, and our, all our conference helpers for making, uh, for working so hard behind the scenes and making this conference such a success as they do every year. So please give them a virtual round of applause on Slack or do, like say light Twitter up with it. But yeah, I'm really glad to have you back in the afternoon. So without further ado, and just to keep uh, in front of the schedule, I'm going to introduce Hugo Herrera, who's the Head of Analytics at East Suffolk and North um, Essex NHS Foundation Trust. Hugo is going to take us through analysing A&E capacity and demand with R. So take it away, Hugo. Thank you very much, Gary. And uh, thanks to everybody uh, um, for NHS R to allow me to, to be here. I'm going to share my screen. Uh, it is a very interesting uh, opportunity having only uh, 10 minutes to, go, to run to, to the work that we're doing. So I thought that the best way to do it would be to actually to share a bit what we are doing at SNEFT uh, and you know how are we approaching this problem and then you can uh, either write to me or, or to my clicks and, uh, and we can we will be happy to collaborate, share a bit of our model or lessons learned and so on. So this work is, uh, was prepared for by myself and uh, Alex Royan, the Head of Business Informatics. We presented this uh, early this year in the OR Society Conference. Uh, but I, I really wanted to talk to, to you guys that are focused on, well, the work in the NHS, that are focused on health and, and really understand what we're talking about because we are, as I said, keen to share what we have done, but also to, to learn from others how they are approaching similar problems. I am not going to spend too much time uh, talking about the challenges about uh, the accidents and emergency for obvious reasons. I think we probably, all of us are probably well familiar with the, the issues that we are facing pretty much people and spending longer times waiting to be, to, to be uh, triaged and to be admitted. And obviously this is not good for people. This also reflects very poorly on performance. And, and puts a lot of stress in our staff because obviously they are trying to uh, to offer the best service possible. Uh, this is becoming uh, or is coming back to us after the pandemic. Obviously, during the pandemic, uh, the situation changed dramatically. So this is these are, are some of our of our breaches. You probably are very well familiar with the four hour standards that we have for any. And you see how in, in one of our hospitals, you know, well, we have been we, with a huge variation, and we'll talk about that in a second. We have been within the hitting and missing the target. And obviously, do, during the pandemic, this totally changed because circumstances were very different. And now that we are going back to normal, uh, we start to see the number of, uh, of uh, admissions rising again back to, to what we were seeing in 2019-20. And at the same time that we keep an eye on the electives and how can we deal with that uh, long uh, waiting list that, that we all have in, uh, in the NHS, how we at the same time are facing the challenge of seeing the same amount or even more people that we used to see before. And, uh, and we, and we have the same capacity or maybe even a reduced capacity uh, to serve them. So we look at simulation as an option for doing that. Why, uh, and what, what I'm going to start by saying what is simulation. So simulation is imitating the real world or the operation of the real world over time. So rather than taking an analytical approach where you just try to solve and static picture of, of the world. Uh, in simulation, you iterate over time. So during a certain number of time lapses, you will rerun your model and you run, your model will recalculate the situation of the system. And some of the variables will change uh, every single time. 
simulation allows us to conceptualize the problem uh, in a different way because just the fact that we have to build this model help us think what are our constraints, why are we, um, you know, where are all leverages that we have, why is this a problem, where, what is exactly a problem that we are trying to solve, help us to explore scenarios, obviously it helps to think what will happen if what can we do? What will happen if, for example, uh, the amount of people coming to the emergency will, will increase because a uh, bunch of people haven't been able to access GP services uh, during the pandemic, for example? Or maybe be, what is what is going to happen if people that is currently in a waiting list, they have been waiting for too long and they will start to show up in the emergency? What will be the difference? It will be a de very different uh, demand, a very different uh, pattern. Likewise, allow us to explore what will happen if we increase our demand, if we become more efficient, where should we uh, become more efficient to have a higher impact? Where should we be putting our efforts? And this is what uh, help us to understand the, the third point of make constraints explicit. So help us to understand where, where, are, the, where are the limits. Uh, in, in this particular case, we use discrete event simulation. That means that, uh, we, we have a, it's, it's it, try to put it in simple terms, it's a queuing model where you have people joining the queue and a, a specific event in this case, for example, triaging triggers something in the system that is people moving through the queue. And I, I'm going to move to, to my next slide to, to, to explain it. So it is a, this is a generic, this is the, the generic discrete event simulation model that you can imagine. So you have people arrive into the system, people queuing, then they are service and then departure. And this is using banking, uh, people in, uh, to, to understand traffic jams, to understand flows in a, in a shopping store. Uh, it, some some uh, like Morrison's desk calls for using it to try to understand how many people could they have uh, within the supermarket, you know, and there were these constraints amount uh, uh, about social distancing and how many people can you have in the area. Uh, and the arrival process is uh, often a Poisson process. Uh, so you use a Poisson distribution to determine uh, the time when each person will arrive. And usually time to complete the process is uh, going to be a uh, norm. Well, it, there are many ways to represent it depending on what is the, the one that fits better to your data, but it's also going to be a, a probability distribution where you will have a a center number and a range uh, uh, or, or a variance that is driven by the process itself. Uh, in this case, what well, we are looking there at the normal distribution process. So our experience, and this is uh, the work in progress things that we are working at the moment. So this is the way that we conceptualize uh, or a, a in the same, in the shape of this uh, discrete event simulation model, we have arrivals, then people queues or is waiting to be triaged once that they triage, they are waiting to be seen, and then once that they are seen, they depart the process. Uh, our long period is often reasonable to assume that the, the parameter lambda in the uh, in the in the Poisson distribution is going to change uh, 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 over time. So that means that you probably will not have the same arrivals at uh, 6 a.m. in the morning, then you will have a noon, then you will have a three in, in, in the morning, or you will have a 10 in the evening. Particularly, we see that in the evening, we have more people coming through the emergency. So uh, what we did in, uh, or what we are doing our approach is, uh, you know, the arrival process is following a Poisson distribution, but this is having a, a, change, a, a parameter that changes over time for Lambda, and that allows us to account for those differences uh, during, the, the, during, the, during the day. Um, important thing in terms of the server, so the server depends on the number of resources. So the both uh, triaging and seeing is going to depend on the number of resources that we have. And this is obviously what the operation is interested on, to understand well, what will happen if we uh, change the amount of resources that we have available uh, to serve our patients. Uh, and, and so obviously this is going to, to be the focus of our model is the, the, you know, what is happening in the emergency department itself. But in order to be admitted, we also need to consider uh, the capacity that is available downstream. So in order for people to be admitted or discharged, 
we will need to consider the capacity downstream. Uh, as you might know, well, once that you have been seen and you have been uh, checked by a doctor, the three potential ways you can go, you can be discharged to your house, you can be discharged to the community, you can be uh, admitted in the hospital for, for further investigation or for treatment. So obviously there is a, a capacity issue here in terms of do we have beds available? Is that a constraint? Do we have teachers available? Is that a constraint is that was preventing people to be admitted? Uh, and, but this is, we consider outside our model uh, at the moment, probably something we would like to investigate in, in, in the near future. So in, in simple terms, this is, so this is the high level view of the model. And then we translate it into this with flows between uh, the different stages of the system, pretty much what we have to put in simple terms is we have lists of people, we have lists of uh, events where people that has arrived and people is taken out of that list of events. You go one minute. Uh, to move to the next one. Uh, and uh, we have done this using this package that probably you're familiar with, that is called SEMA. And uh, the results are very encouraging. So still work in progress, as I say, but uh, it allows really to, to replicate to, to some a degree of precision, uh, what is going to be the the forecast of the demand and uh, the waiting times that we will have in our system. And uh, so this is where we are at the moment, and because I only have one minute, <laughs> um, I had to rush in the last minute, uh, slide, but this is where we are at the moment. We are starting to investigate what are the constraints and what kind of things we can do uh, you know, to unblock the system and reduce those waiting times. Where are we going to have the higher impact? So thank you very much. Absolutely fantastic presentation, Hugo. In terms of a question from me, will the code, when it's like say completed, be available to share on GitHub? Will it be something that we can like say post around the R community as as learn practice? Yeah, absolutely. We'll be happy to share. And and this, is, as I said at the start, this is something that we're very keen to do to share with all of you and get some feedback as well and potential improvements to the code. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure this has got wide-reaching application and there'll be a lot of A&E functions that are looking at kind of modeling similar processes. I know I've worked on a, a machine learning project in A&E, so this is another way of looking at it in terms of simulation. So, yeah, I think it's got wide-reaching, uh, like say, impl impl implications and it'd be good um, to see how you're utilising the SIMA package because I'm aware of it and I've used it myself. But, yeah, when the code's available, please share it around. Yeah, absolutely. Keep keep an eye on the Slack. We will share that probably in the first step. All right, Hugo. Fantastic. If you can stop sharing your screen and then I'll uh, bring on the next presenter, but thank you for that. Okay. Okay, so the next speaker is um, Dr. Will Bryant, who's a senior data scientist from Great Ormond Street uh, Hospital, NHS Trust. Today is going to be talking about predicting length of stay to improve patient flow, operational data science using R, tidy models and targets. I know Will and I have been speaking about tidy models uh, a few times, so I'm really interested to uh, to see how this presentation goes. So yeah, Will, take the floor. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Gary. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, I can hear and see you. Oh, brilliant. Um, so you, you, you've said everything on here. Um, so I think... I was perhaps a little bit um, keen with my title. I think having seen all the operational data science uh, and the flows and simmer and, and all that stuff, we never got that far here. This is really a proof of concept. Um, I'll show a little bit of, of code and I'll try and give some, some of my thoughts on the way that, that projects um, using data science might be deployed or developed within trusts. Um, sorry, it's not, there we go. So I'm, uh, what does the, the DRE team do at Gorsh? So we're a research consultancy um, and we also coordinate research infrastructure. So we've got a, a data pipeline to provide data to um, researchers within the trust. And we also um, coordinate with a third party, um, Iridia, who have a, a trusted research environment, which we, we use and we provide to, to researchers in the trust and beyond. Um, we do a lot of proofs of concept, um, testing the, the infrastructure and also um, around advanced analytics. Um, we, we advocate, um, increasingly advocate for our and advanced analytics uh, within data teams and clinical teams in the trust. Um, so specifically for this, 
project, um, how do we start working on it? So that we have an acute need for, for improvements in, in bed flow in the trust, as has been, um, you know, as much is the case across the NHS. Um, there was a serendipitous discussion between our director of innovation and a company called Atos. Um, specifically, I, I want to call out James Perrett from, from Atos, who, who helped a lot with the development of the POC. Um, they're an, a data science consultancy. They've deployed a similar, um, something to work on a similar problem. I, I believe it leads A&E. Um, also, um, either there is a lack of data science know-how anywhere else in the trust, uh, or more likely there's plenty of data science across the trust, completely siloed in various specialties uh, and, uh, and teams. Um, so what's the situation? So wards in the trust can be very near capacity at the beginning of the day. Uh, and if the hospital's too full, then uh, they turn patients away. So they, they ask them not to come, they delay uh, elective surgeries, things like that. Uh, but often by the evenings, the beds have in fact become freed up um, and those could have been used for those patients who, who, were, who were turned away. So the task is to estimate the number of beds available by the end of the day, at the beginning of the day, uh, to include uncertainty as an integral part of that, of that readout, and then to work out how that readout could be uh, integrated into the bed flow process within the trust. Um, so I should also say this was done in, in coordination with our command and control team uh, in, in the trust. Uh, so the initial action was to show that the, some of the data we had um, as a proof of concept could, could inform us, tell us something about the length of stay of patients. That's a very long way away from, from the task itself, but it was just a, yeah, as I say, proof of concept. Um, so what question could we do? So we, we had a very short time period. Um, we had about, I think I would say two weeks to develop this as a, as a POC. Um, so we needed something very straightforward. Um, I, so I started with a classification well, your signal's yep. breaking up a little bit in terms of the, the sound. Sorry to interrupt. So can you hear me better now? It's still slightly breaking up like there's a connectivity problem. Yeah, I think it might be. I'm not sure what I can... That's a lot better now, Will. Okay. That's a lot better. I won't move then. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, so... Uh, I started, we started with a couple of different models. Um, I didn't have a strong preference, but we wanted something explainable. Um, so we started with a random forest logistic regressions and an XG boost. Um, so what data were relevant? We have admissions and ward stays, patient demographics, and a problem list. So we, we have Epic, um, which has something called problem list, which is the current diagnoses as identified by clinicians at the time when the patient's being seen, as opposed to coded diagnoses, which are retrospectively added to the system. Um, so there is a what outcome, but I'm not going to focus on this because uh, that's not the, the key thing I want to talk about here. Um, it was a random forest classifier, um, which predicted that the patients would stay one day, or, uh, more than one day or not. Um, and we got an alternate accuracy on a fairly straightforward model, uh, nothing special. Um, the importance showed up that the, the hospital admission service, uh, the, the hospital service that the patient was admitted to and the admission source were important, as was previous inpatient admissions in identifying how long they would stay. So about the how, which I think is more pertinent to us here, um, I use the targets pipeline um, tool, uh, which is a bit like make. Um, it splits the, the analytics, the data engineering and the analytics pipeline into targets and functions. The targets make up what's called a directed acyclic graph. And so they're, they're hierarchical dependencies. So each, each target will be dependent on targets uh, upstream uh, without any cyclic dependency. So nothing depends on itself. So you never get in a, in a loop of, of dependency. Uh, you only rerun functions, recreate targets with upstream that have upstream dependency changes. Um, and you can also do dynamic target creation uh, to, for high performance computing, but I've never actually done that myself. Tidy models is an ecosystem of packages. Um, in fact, 
uh, Julia Silge is, is doing the keynote this afternoon and she was one of the, the key developers, core developers of, of that. So um, hopefully I'm not um, trashing it as a, as a system. Um, so it's uh, designed essentially for tidying up modeling in the, in the tidyverse sense. Um, it provides a consistent API for various models, including the ones I talked about. Um, and also one of the key things about this, which I think is sometimes lost when you're thinking about deploying this in, a, in an operational sense, is that you can train a pre-processing step on your um, training data or your, your uh, historical data, uh, which you can then apply um, to new examples that come along, which is key to getting accurate um, accurate results uh, when you're when you're modeling so quickly um, the architecture we have this python etl pipeline which pulls data from our data warehouses into the uh, into the pipeline for analytics i've created an analysis template which which we use in the team um, which integrates targets for for simple um, for reproducible use of, of analytics um, and i use targets and tidy models in a rather um, interchangeable way in my in my code um, here's a little bit of my targets code um, there's a high level running plan um, uh, will will the stories come in again are you okay just to switch your camera off it might improve the audio because it's starting to break up again apologies yeah. okay can you hear me okay can you just repeat that will can you hear me now? It's still breaking up slightly, but it's just, it's just slightly better. Okay, well, um, hang on a moment. I do have a... Whatever you did then, it's fantastic now. Oh, yeah, I, I moved my head an inch. Okay, um, so, uh, yeah, it's, so this we've split the, um, the pipeline into various steps, um, which you can see here separated by commas at the end. Um, it provides a high level running plan. So if you name your functions well and your targets, you can understand this at a high level without having to dive into the details of the, of the R code. Um, it only reruns the stale steps. Um, it's potentially you can reuse functions across models and data sets without running into problems of, um, of having to comment and uncomment code all over the place. Um, but it's not optimal for, for exploratory development, which, um, is much better done in, in something like our markdown. So uh, I say how to use tidy models, how to use targets. Um, this is how I use them. Um, so there's plenty of scope for, for doing it better. Uh, so it's object oriented and modular. Um, it follows the workflow recipe model structure. So the workflow contains everything you need to know uh, to run the model. Uh, the recipe is the pre-processing and uh, the model is, is the model. Um, it's all pulled together and there, there are some nice functions around developing these uh, these workflows and then doing, for instance, tuning here, uh, which I do it on a grid for, for my random forest. Um, so I've done, th there is a question here. So targets is really good for pulling out um, th this sort of heavy lifting on tuning, but it's integrated at the moment within tidy models. So I haven't worked out how to bring that outside into targets. And there's an ongoing question about what is what object is the right target. Um, and here I'm cheating and I use a list to pass out multiple objects in a single function. Um, so the models and recipes can, can be defined in targets to pass between workflows um, with minimal code and, and compute duplication. Uh, models can be built stepwise without ad hoc commenting in and commenting out bits. Uh, we can integrate it with Python um, and you can use targets functions uh, along, along with Python the same as with R. Uh, you can track source file changes and um, just a little thing about um, open sourcing. So uh, you can use .n to mask uh, internal um, structures. Uh, so the further thoughts, so the code development is quite good in, in targets because you can each develop your own functions and they're not um, and they're independent from each other. They're separated in separate files. Uh, they're good tools for prototype organizing and, and sharing code. There is no best practice though, and, and there is a risk of premature optimization. 
there's a question for if, if targets is too much for a particular um, project, and it's a similar question to the package dilemma. It depends on the shape and size of the problem. In terms of project management, we discovered we tried to allow the Atos site data science team to, to work on these data, but given the time restraints, it was a massive advantage. We, we had an, in, uh, an in-house team that could do it straight away rather than depending on um, a research uh, approval uh, and uh, things like that. And we're simultaneously doing analytics and uh, developing the way we do analytics. And I think that's really important, that agile approach, which has been shown in a number of um, projects, a number of talks in the last couple of days. <clears throat> in terms of the generalizability, um, this is a POC, but, but what if we had realized the full thing? Uh, would it be useful? Could we pass it to other trusts? Essentially, there's a massive data engineering and data model issue around this. Um, how do you generate a data model? We use a custom one, but we're exploring how to use uh, perhaps OMOP or FIRE to, to help with that. You also need the infrastructure to train and run uh, the project because it will need retraining and adaptation. Uh, we, we're a specialist tertiary trust. We don't have an a &E, so we're very different to, to many other trusts. And you would, may well find that different features are important for different trusts. Um, so thanks uh, to the Deary Data Engineering team, the James Perrett and the Atos team, uh, the Gosh Command and Control team, and Andrew Taylor, who's our Director of Innovation. Uh, I'm reviewing the code uh, to go on GitHub. And uh, just if I have one more second, a quick thing. Someone mentioned Reactable, and I... I had a lot of fun with that, and I just wanted to show um, that I've been playing with it, and you can get these great spark lines and uh, inline uh, um, bar charts inside reactable tables. Thank you very much. For no, that's excellent, Will. One question from me. So you said something around um, the interconnectivity between tidy models, because it runs a separate engine, doesn't it, for each machine learning model? And... Um, the targets package just explain that a little bit uh yeah sure so the um that the there is a high level interface to to um tune um within the tidy models uh, framework so that's just a call to a function <clears throat> what that doesn't necessarily allow you to do is obviously you're tuning perhaps across 100 or 200 um you know sets of hyperparameters mm -hmm. really you'd be able to split that up and then push it to various you know, through Kubernetes or whatever to, to multiple machines to, and then uh, collate those data. And that's something that you, you'd need to work on. So I don't have a solution to that. Um, you know, at the moment, it's just dependent on that one core in our, um, yeah. Yeah, okay. I mean, well, it's something that we can have a talk about because I've done model deployment using tidy models and making it uh, through a Dockerized container. So perhaps we can take that offline, but I'm happy to help. Yeah, I'd love to. Thanks. Yeah. Drop me a note on Slack. Thanks, Will. Thanks for the presentation. If you can stop sharing now, um, and I'll bring on the next speaker. So, okay. Thanks for those two really great presentations from Hugo and Dr. Will uh, Bryant at, at Great Ormond Street. Next, we've got Neil Gobbazanova, who's the Deputy Head of Transformation for NHS England talking about all challenges and opportunities in the delivery of an NHS service. Sorry, Nelly, God was and over, apologies. <laughs> Hi, Nelly, you're on mute. Sorry, uh, no problems. Can you hear me now? I can hear you fine, yeah. If you can share your screen and we can get going. Yes. Thank you. Um, apologies for mispronouncing. <laughs> no, no problems. Uh, so do you see my screen now? I can see it fine, thank you. If you can put it into presentation mode. Yep. That's okay. brilliant, thank you. So good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for the opportunity to give this talk. My name is Nelly Garbuzanova, and today I'm going to give you the user perspective of someone who has just started using R and sees many opportunities for collaboration, especially in areas uh, and with themes not usually associated with data science and, and data analysis. 
So as a commissioner of NHS services, um, my team and I are responsible for commissioning a range of services from treatment in cancer to critical care transfers. And a lot of our day-to-day -day job includes um, developing business cases, options appraisals, and influencing and convincing people in service improvement initiatives. So when I joined my current team in November last year, my first task was to develop a business case for improving critical care transfers in the region. We are a big region, east of England, um, and there was some anecdotal evidence that for certain patches of the region, patients need to travel uh, more if they need to go from one hospital to another, for whatever reason, whether it's capacity, expertise, care closer to home. So we wanted to understand whether this is true and to, to potentially model where a transfer team should sit in the east of England so that patients can travel speedily and, uh, and, and have high quality care. But how do you make such a strategic decision? Where do you start? And we started by looking at the data, of course. We had a number of problems with that. We had some data on postcodes and number of transfers, for example, but we had some missing data as well on travel times, distances, and we had to manually um, collate uh, some of the routes that were used by uh, by vehicles and the, even the data that we had was not tidy was not structured so it was a bit of a mess and nobody could have drawn any any conclusions from this from, from the data so I must have been really frustrated at the time when I was working on this business case because at some point my partner who is a cancer scientist um, asked if asked me if I'm okay and when I explained my problem he said why don't you use R I think it will help so we sat together and um, found different packages and collated different uh, sets of data, linked different formats and, uh, formats and came up with, with this wonderfully structured data arranged in a really tidy way. And if I can share now, um, I don't know if you see my, uh, I would like to share with you what we did. Can you see this cataplot which I'm sharing now? I can see it fine. So this is what we came up with for an hour or so. And I really liked it because to me, um, as a commissioner of services, uh, it, it gives me quite a lot of, of good information and it allows me to interact and hover over the dots and understand what are the number of transfers for how many minutes the transfer is done, which hospital from which hospital to which hospital. But most importantly, it gave me the understanding that quite a lot of the uh, long transfers happening in, in the north of the region, around Norfolk uh, and, and Peterborough. So for me, this was really, really helpful data. Now, going back to my presentation, uh, bear with me a second, sharing again. Um, current slide. So this good uh, data visualization and data plotting helped me draw some conclusions uh, and also allowed me to to have this structured data uh, and create these heat maps in Excel. So I was using both Excel and R and, and allowed me to see that it's not only important what's the total distance covered by vehicles, but also what's the total time traveled for patients. And in this way to prioritize resources, focus on patients and better decide where to put a transfer team. So I think this is not the only example of where R could, could help along the commissioning cycle. And here I give you like a, a general um, commissioning cycle that, that commissioners like me work, um, uh, work in their day-to-day -day jobs. So starting from the need identification, strategy, implementation of the strategy, contracting, delivering of the service and review of the entire cycle. And I think there are many opportunities to use both the technical and the people's strengths of R, technical when it comes to data collection, analysis, visualization, but most importantly, the understanding of data, the, the, the ability to draw conclusions when you see structured and tidy, tidy data and to influence your internal and external stakeholders. So moving into the, the details of this cycle, um, 
on, on day one, a link called talk about opportunities to engage patient, uh, patients in the R community. And I think along this cycle, there are plenty of opportunities to do this. Uh, and, and of course, plenty of opportunity to, to, to do this through R as well. For example, at the needs identification stage, we do a lot of consultations, patient engagement, collecting data, basically building up the business case uh, that we're going to, to present later on. And this is where the technical strengths of R, I think, could be really helpful. Even if we have, uh, we also establish the team at this stage, the team that will be delivering the project. So if we have somebody in the team with awareness of R or expertise in R, this would be really helpful as well. At the strategy stage, I think the interactive features of R, the, in, the impressive graphs and, and mapping and um, everything that I just showed you on this cutter plot could be really helpful to convince stakeholders and to show this to clinicians, to senior managers. And even uh, I just noted the simulation processes that um, the previous speaker mentioned that could be really helpful to simulate the different options, the diff different scenarios. Um, and I think this, this would be really, really helpful. At the process stage where we usually either contract, renegotiate, go out to procurement, it would be really helpful to um, automate um, the, the reporting, the reports that we create. Sometimes we send out questionnaires to providers to complete and a lot of this can be automated. And I think our, our can be a really big, a, a good force for, for doing that. At the contracting stage, where we conclude contracts, uh, develop KPIs, and, and negotiate and agree contracts, tables. I, I attended one of the workshops on, on day one, and it was really good about tables, dashboards, but also any uh, useful and helpful tools for managing contract, contract data would be really appreciated. At the delivery stage, it's really important to have uh, transparent uh, data and good reporting and to be able to collate, collate um, and somehow link the different reporting tools, provider reporting, internal business intelligence team reporting, external reporting. So uh, the, the data wrangling uh, skills would be really, really helpful at this stage. And finally, this cycle is a dynamic cycle. It's not a static cycle. and we need to constantly receive feedback, constantly improve um, the activities that we do alongside the cycle at each stage. And at the review stage, if we can have some R support with merging data from different stages, evaluating what we have done, evaluating any reasons for variations, this would be really helpful. And even more importantly, there, there can be some long-term efficiencies. Um, I think having um, data expertise, our expertise will save us a lot of costs having to commission separate consultancies outside of the NHS and having to pay a lot for, that, for those. So two more examples uh, in which I think R could be very helpful. One is the collaborative in collaborative projects. This is due to the DR collaborative and open source nature. In a recent cancer project I, I was part of, this was a big collaboration between NHS, external organizations, academia, local authorities, and we were looking at the wider determinants of health and health inequalities. We were mapping cancer stages and pathways against deprivation indexes. And the problem was that every organization had data, but how do we link these different data? How do we tell a coherent story and how do we um, consolidate it? And I think this is where R can help us find those links, draw the conclusions, find correlation and establish causal links. At the end of this project, we had to present our 60 page report to senior stakeholders and we use PowerPoint. What if we had used R with some of its interactive features? This would have been brilliant. And when it comes to integration in the integration agenda of the current um, system, the DNHS, I think joint data from health and social care will be, will be the norm at some point. And not, not only, we need to find way to merge data from housing associations, environmental and climate, climate change agencies. And I think there is a great potential for R in, in this respect and for telling this story locally using the interactive features of R. In conclusion, R can be uh, really helpful in all stages of the commissioning cycle with both its technical and people's um, strengths and aspects. Uh, I know through this conference, we are trying to increase the profile of, of R and similar concepts and to complement other tools and expertise. We need to collaborate more, uh, have more targeted training to more diverse teams. And looking ahead, I see 
uh, expanding training for departments not usually associated with data science and collaborating on proof of concepts projects with our experts, having ad hoc our support for commissioning projects and continuing the mapping with our specialists, NHS data specialists and, and, and other teams. Thank you for listening um, and I'm happy to take any questions. That's a really great presentation. Thanks, Nelly. Um, Mohammed's not so much a question, but more of a proposal for help, uh, an offer of help. So Mohammed's proposing that we do a hack day to work through how obviously the NHS all can help you in your various challenges. Because yeah, you're right, all can do all those things. There's a lot of things it can do. So it's, uh, yeah, it's potentially something that we could do as a hack day, if that's something that sounds good. Thank you. Um, so in terms of, I've got a question from Will as well on the chat, so let me bring that up. I think it's, I think it's actually on the chat page itself. So Will asks, uh, this is a fantastic way to break down opportunities and challenges. How do you organize a team to work across all these organizations and capabilities? Um, do, do you mean how do I organize my team? <laughs> So my team is um, is part of a bigger team, and 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 we, yeah, it's 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 a challenge, uh, but we generally have uh, different different departments dealing one department dealing with with acute health, another with mental health, and another with uh, health and justice projects and specialized commissioning. Um, so. I, th I think uh, we do have a business intelligence and data team, which which are also really really good in what they do. We have a contracting team, so we have we have uh, quite quite good capabilities within the team. But I just think we need we need something to to glue them up and to we have a finance team as well. Forgot to say. Um, so and ev everyone is allocated to different projects. So this is this is the way it works at the moment. Um, I don't know if if I have asked, answered the question that he wanted. Uh, Will wanted answered, but I mean, like you say, Will and you can take that offline. But I think that was a sufficient answer myself. Um, so I think there's one new message just sitting on the chat. Will says yes, thanks. It does answer his question fully. So Thank thanks you. for your time today, Nelly. It was a really great presentation. Thank you. If you can stop you. sharing your screen. Thank you. Yep. Right. Okay. So there's one last thing that um, we want to ask you from the NHSR community. So let's make a pledge. We're doing it at the moment on our Twitter campaign, but there's also, let's do it in, in Zoom as well. So what we want the pledge to be is a pledge to do a blog or just join Slack or suggest a solution as my talk um, talked about this morning. Put a solution forward. You don't have to actually see the solution through. We want some new idea generation is what we're looking for. Or apply to be a fellow or a, apply for a title, like a champion or an associate. There's loads of different roles that we need in the NHSR community to make this uh, community grow even further and even faster than it has already. Or deliver training um, such as workshops or others, other things like webinars etc so yeah make the pledge and there's a twitter campaign going around at the moment which is on the nhsr community website so please sign up and make a pledge pretty please right okay so there is a great set of lightning talks and speakers we're going to break shortly and come back at approximately precisely four o'clock because we've got julia silgi who's data scientist and software engineer at our studio uh, I'm probably fanboying a little bit because she is one of the, well, she works on the Tidy Models project with Max Kuhn, who's a big hero of mine. So, uh, yeah, come back at four o'clock and uh, enjoy a quick coffee break. Okay, see you soon.
Welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a lovely break. So I'm excited to announce our keynote speaker. We've got Julia Silgi, who's a data scientist and software engineer from our studio. Julia is going to be talking today about creating features for machine learning from text. A little bit about Julia. She likes Jane Austen books, black coffee, as she's already typed on the comments, red wine, me too. Um, and if you don't know Julia or not, you know, in the R community and around tidy models, where have you been? She works in text mining, supervised machine learning, modeling with tidy data principles, and she works on the tidy models team. So take the floor, Julia, and great to have you. Thank you so much for, um, for that introduction. I appreciate that so much. I'm going to share my screen here, and um, I'm going to make sure I can see the chat so that if someone, you know, in, these, in this era of remote um, talks, I want to make sure I can see the chat so someone's like, something terrible has gone awry, and I don't just keep talking to my screen for multiple minutes with something uh, there. All right, I should be able to so see that good, there. Julia. All right, excellent. All right, so um, yes, thank you so so much for that wonderful introduction. I want to um, thank the NHSR community so much for the opportunity um, to speak to you all today. I'm, I'm, I'm really happy to be specifically speaking about um, feature engineering for text data, and that's for a couple of reasons. Um, having a better understanding of what we do to text data to make it appropriate um, as input for machine learning al algorithms has a lot of benefits for lots of different kinds of people. Um, um, both if you are you are directly getting ready to train a model and you have text data that you need to use to train that model, um, or if you're at the beginning of a text analysis project that maybe isn't specifically going to be used for machine learning, um, but you you want to know like what kinds of things you know could it maybe be used for later, and you want to set up and understand what the inputs might be. Or if you're trying to um, understand the behavior of a model that you're interacting with in some way, um, some off the shelf model of which there are more and more every day, um, some system, you know, that your system needs to interact with or, um, you know, there's so many, there's so many examples of this. Um, so there, there, so this is applicable to lots of different kinds of people and, and I think increasing more and more and more. Um, so, oops, let me get my... There we go. So when so when we build models for text, either um, either supervised models where we've got labels on our data, or unsupervised models where we want to um, be able to um, uh, like like understand like use use like data the text data that we have and be able to kind of like uh, cl cluster it or understand topics in it or something, we start with something that looks like this. This is some example data I'll use a couple times um, in this talk. It describes animals, um, uh, like there's different documents that describe different animals. And we, we do have some labels on this data that are about like the diets of the animals. So this looks familiar to me and to you. Uh, we're, we're writers and speakers of human language and we can look at this and we can um, uh, we can we can uh, parse it. We can understand it. Um, though this kind of data is being generated all the time in all kinds of contexts. So you all who you know work at the NHS, I'm sure has a, have observed this. Um, uh, text data is being generated by um, survey takers, um, uh, by by you know by by electronic health records, by um, clinicians writing notes, by various um, um, you know patient processes by you know by social media if you know if you have been involved in um that in a healthcare setting um and this is true outside of healthcare as well um so however um com computers aren't great at doing math at language <laughs> that's represented like this um uh and when we um there we go and and language has to be um quite dramatically transformed to a uh, machine readable numeric rep representation that is more like this one to be ready for computation for almost any kind of model um, supervised or unsupervised so i spent a fair amount of time um, working on software for people to be able to exploratory data analysis you know, summarization, visualization, and so forth with uh, text in a tidy data format where you have like one observation per row, 
Um, but when it comes time to build a model using some kind of you know, machine learning algorithm, what the underlying mathematical implementation needs is typically something like this. Um, this is a way to display what's called a document term matrix. So we've got um, the, the documents or the rows, the terms or tokens, in this case words, are the columns. And um, what in this case was going in there in the um, in like what was represented in the matrix are the counts, like how many times does each document use each word. So there's, uh, you know, and the numbers are high. Um, there's a lot of zeros there. Um, this is a document term matrix. So the exact representation may differ from what I've shown here. You might wait by um, a different statistic than counts than counting. You might use like what's called TFIDF instead of counts, or we might, um, instead of, you know, representing like this, we might make a different kind of matrix that keeps sequence information. This is out fun what happens when we build deep learning models. But for basically all text modeling, from, you know, simpler models like naive Bayes models to word embeddings to like the really state of the art stuff that's out there right now, that like, like transformers. Um, we have to heavily feature engineer and process language to get it to some kind of representation that is suitable for um, for machine learning algorithms. So I work on a um, an open so source framework in R for modeling and machine machine learning that's called Tidy Models, and a lot of the examples I'll be showing today use Tidy Models code. So, so um, some of the specific goals of the Tidy Models project are pr to provide um, a consistent, flexible framework for um, real world modeling practitioners, those who are just starting out th to those who are very experienced, um, and to harmonize the heterogeneous interfaces that we have within R for modeling and um, to encourage good statistical practice. So I'm, I'm really glad to get to show some of what I work on and build and how it applies to text modeling. But a lot of what we'll talk about today isn't specific to tidy models or even specific to R. Um, what we're focusing on actually here in this talk is these basics. How do we transform text into predictors for, um, for machine learning? So in, um, so tidy models is a meta package, uh, similar to the way that, to that the tidyverse is. So if you've ever typed library tidyverse and then use, you know, ggplot2 for visualization um, and dplyr for data manipulation, uh, tidy models works um, the same way. So uh, pre-processing or feature engineering, well, you know, what we're talking about in this talk, is part of a broader model uh, process. Um, it starts, um, well, really, you could argue it starts with that exploratory data analysis piece where you learn stuff that you then can use to make better decisions about your modeling. Um, and maybe we could say it comes to completion with model evaluation, where we, um, where we have, uh, 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 measure how well the model performs. So tidy models as a piece of software is made up of R packages, each of which has a specific focus. So um, R sample is the package that um, handles resampling data, like making cross validation folds, bootstrap folds, um, splitting your data to start with, you know, into testing and training. Um, uh, the, the tune package is for tuning, for like hyperparameter tuning of, of parameters. Um, and one of these packages is for feature engineering, for, for data pre-processing and feature engineering. That one is called um, recipes. Because in um, tidy models, we capture um, data pre-processing and feature engineering in this concept of a pre-processing recipe that has steps. So you choose what um, variables or ingredients you're going to use, then you define the steps and prepare them using um, training data 
And then once you have this prepared recipe, you can apply it to, um, to any other data set, like testing data, if you're in the process of developing your, your model, or new data, if it's prediction time, if you're at prediction time. Um, so the um, uh, recipes is designed very carefully to um, avoid problems of data leakage during feature engineering. So the variables or ingredients that we use in modeling come in all kinds of different shapes and sizes, um, including um, text data. So some of the techniques and approaches we use for pre-processing uh, text data to get it ready for a model are the same as for any other kind of data we might have. Um, but some of what you need to know to be able to do a good job um, in this, you know, in this whole model building process for text is different and is specific to the, to the nature of what language data is like. Um, so I've written a book with my co-author, Emil Wiefeldt, on um, supervised machine learning for text analysis in R. And, and actually, fully the first third of the book focuses on how we um, transform um, natural language into features for modeling. Um, the middle section of the book is about how to use those features that we create um, with text in, you know, what you might call uh, traditional um, machine learning models like uh, regularized regression, support vector machines, and other types of models that tend to work well with text. And then the last third talks about how we use uh, deep learning models with text data. So deep learning models actually still require um, most of these kinds of transformations from natural language to the, uh, like a mathematical representation. Um, but deep learning models are also able to um, inherently learn um, structures or features from text that often some of those more traditional models are not able to. So this book is now done, published, <laughs> finally. Um, uh, you know, folks are getting their print copies if they pre-ordered, um, but it's also available in its entirety at um, smalltar.com. So you can see an HTML version there. So if, if you're new to dealing with text data, um, Understanding these like fundamental pre-processing approaches for text um, sets you up for being able to train an effective model. Um, if you're really experienced with text data, like if you have been around the block, you know, with text data, you, you probably have noticed that um, the existing resources that are out there, like whether it's, you know, books or um, blog posts or um, tutorials, um, it is sparse when it comes to like a like a detailed, thoughtful exploration of how these pre-processing steps, how they work, um, and how choices that are made in feature engineering impact the output of the model, the models that we have. So let's walk through several um, of these pre-processing steps, these feature engineering steps for text, talk about what they are, how they work, and the kind of impact that they have. Let's start with tokenization. So typically, one of the first steps in the transformation from natural language, like what we you know, speak and write, um, to a, a machine learning feature, like a useful feature for a machine learning model, or really any kind of text analysis, including um, EDA before you build a model, um, or you know, if you're not gonna build a model at all, you're just trying to understand what's in your data, is tokenization. So in tokenization, we take some kind of input, like a string, um, and a token type, some meaningful unit of text, like a word would be the most common one, and we split the input into pieces or tokens that correspond um, to that type. So, mo you know, most commonly that the, mo the meaningful unit or type of token that we want to split text into is, is the word. So this might seem straightforward, but it turns out it's difficult to clearly define what a word is for many or even most um, languages. So many languages don't use white space between words at all. And even languages that do use white space, um, including English, um, often have particular examples that are ambiguous. And then, you know, like romance languages, like Italian and French, use pronouns and negation words um, that may better be um, 
consider prefixes that have a space and then eat then we have like English contractions like didn't that um, might more accurately be considered two words with no space. So even, you know, even at this like very first step, we're like, oh no, wait, this is ambiguous. And um, I'm not sure what the right, you know, like it, it's, it's like, we have to do something, right? But even at this first step, we um, are faced with the fact that like language is complicated. Um, once we make this, these first choices, right, we make these first choices, um, it's on your data is on its way to be able to be features, be used in EDA or unsupervised algorithms or um, in predictive modeling, like these results shown here. So these are results from um, a regression model trained on descriptions of media from artwork um, in the Tate collection. Um, so we see here that um, artwork, so we're, what we were doing is we were predicting um, when the artwork was created. So that's the outcome that we're predicting. So the outcome is um, time. Um, and then the the features like is, is text describing what was what is the art medium that was used to um, to create the artwork. So artwork created using, um, you know, graphite, um, watercolor, engraving, these are more likely to come from uh, uh, older artwork and artwork created using um, photography, um, screen printing, as well as um, dung and glitter, like this is more likely to become, to be uh, created, or that artwork is later. It's more from, from newer contemporary art. So the way that we um, tokenize the natural human generated language that we started with describing the medium of each art piece of art has a big impact on what we learn from it. So if we tokenized in a different way, we would have gotten different results here in terms of um, performance, like how well could we predict the creation date of each piece of artwork. And then um, also in terms of interpreting the model, like um, uh, what, what we were able to learn from it. So another way to tokenize is instead of breaking up into single words, which are also called unigrams, we can tokenize to n-grams. So an n-gram is a continuous sequence of n items from a given sequence of text. <clears throat> so this shows that same example text um, describing our animal, the, the collared peccary, and divided up into bigrams uh, or, uh, or n-grams with two tokens. So notice how the word, the words in the bigrams overlap so that the word collared um, appears in both of the first um, two n-grams. So n-gram tokenization slides along the text to create overlapping sets of tokens. So this shows trigrams for the same text. So using unigrams is you know, faster and more efficient, but we don't capture any information about word order. If you hear, you know, the phrase bag of words, it's they're talking about unigrams where it's like literally picture taking all the words, throwing in a bag and mixing them up. Right. Like we're not keeping any information about the order of words um, using a higher value for N, like two or three or even you know more keeps more information about how words are used together. But the vector space of tokens increases dramatically. Um, this corresponds to a reduction in token counts, like how many times we see each token. And that means, depending on your particular data set, um, you might not be able to get good um, results um, with your, your modeling or your even your EDA. So um, uh, one thing that sometimes works well is combining different degrees of n-grams, like including like one and two. Um, that, that lets you extract different levels of detail from text data. So unigrams tell you which individual words have been used a lot of times. Um, some of those words would be overlooked in bigram or trigram counts because, um, you know, they maybe don't co-appear with other words, you know, as often as if you count them alone. So this plot compares model performance for a lasso regression model, um, 
uh, for a data set of um, opinions from the United States Supreme Court. Um, so what we're predicting here again is the date. So like that other thing I just showed you. So what we're trying to say, we're saying here's an opinion written by the United States Supreme Court, um, which are, um, uh, and, and, and we, you know, we, so we have so many, such a long time, like two, 300 years, right? Yeah. Anyway, and we had, so we have like several, a couple hundred years of, um, these opinions and we can, we can say like, based on the text of them, is it a older Supreme court opinion or is it a newer Supreme court opinion? So what, what this plot is saying is like, if we include more engrams, does the model get better? So it compares only unigrams, unigrams and bigrams, and unigrams, bigrams, and trigrams. So in this case, we I held the number of tokens constant. So I didn't I didn't include um, more and more and more um, tokens. I just said, okay, if we keep the number of tokens constant, does including higher order information help? Um, and here. Uh, we've got RMSC root mean squared error on the on the year there on the y axis and notice using unigrams alone performs best for this particular corpus. So this is not always the case, depending on the kind of model you use the data set itself, we might see the best performance by you know, you know, combining unigrams or bigrams or some other option. So in this case, if we if we were like, oh, I really want to incorporate that higher order information, we probably would need to increase the number of tokens considerably, which might not be doable given the size of the data set. But, you know, in a different data set, maybe we would be able to. Um, so so I'm just going to highlight here. Um, so machine learning in general is a, a heuristic field or a, no, I'm going to say a, an empirical field. It's an empirical field. And so we don't know ahead of time what the right answer is going to be. So you, the only way to know what the right option is to try different options and measure. Um, so one thing, though, for n-grams is keep in mind, identifying n-grams is computationally expensive, especially compared to how much improvement in model performance you often end up with. Like here we saw zero improvement. It got worse. But often if you do see improvement, um, the amount of improvement you see is quite modest as, um, relative to the investment of computational time you get so for so just to give you some idea of this for this data set of supreme court opinions we're looking here right now using bigrams plus unigrams takes more than twice as long to train as only unigrams when you add in tri trigrams as well it takes almost five times as long as training on unigrams alone um, so remember i kept the number of tokens constant so this is almost all coming from the feature engineering because the number of tokens going into the model is is constant all right we can go the other direction so we can tokenize to larger and larger structures we can also tokenize to units that are smaller than words like these are called character shingles so it's that same data set but we slide along and we create um uh these are these are uh three character shingles is what these are called there are multiple different ways to break words up into subwords that are appropriate for machine learning um, often these approaches or algorithms um, have the, a benefit of being able to encode um, unknown words that are new at prediction time so you know like picture this is very common you've got a training set right it's got a bunch of words in it at prediction time when you have like new data coming in what happens if you have a new word um, often um, using subword information is can be helpful because um, you can use subwords that you had a subword in your training set and you know what to do with it it's and that's because using this kind of subword information is a way to incorporate what are called morphological sequences into our model. That's a word from like linguistics. If um, any of you have that kind of background, um, it's like like how do how are words put together? How are words put together? So these are results are from a classification model um, with a data set of very short text, very very short, just the names of post offices in the United States. 
So this, what this model does is it says, let's take the names of all the post offices in the United States and let's see if we can classify them as to whether they are in Hawaii or they're in the rest of the United States. And so I created features for the model that are subwords of the post office names. And we end up learning here that names that start with H or P or contain that ale um, subword are more likely to be in Hawaii. And on the flip side, the subwords that are like A-N-D, um, R-I-I-N-G, those are things that you are more likely to be outside of, um, of Hawaii. All right, so in tidy models, we collect all these kinds of decisions about tokenization in, in code that looks like this. So we start with a um, recipe that specifies what variables we'll use, then we define the pre-processing steps. Um, and so even at this like very first and arguably like pretty simple and most basic step, um, the choices we make um, affect our modeling in in a pretty significant way like they affect like what what we'll learn what we'll do in a pretty big way um the once the now let's move to like another another pre-processing step once we have split to our text into tokens we often find that not all words carry um the same amount of information, if maybe any information at all for um, our analysis or some kind of like machine learning task. So common words that carry little or um, maybe no meaningful information are, are called um, stop words. So it's common advice or practice to uh, remove stop words like this for various natural language processing tasks. So what I'm showing here is the entirety of one of the shorter um, English stop word lists that's used really broadly. So, you know, it's a lot of um, um, pronouns, conjunctions, things like that. So this decision to just uh, remove stop words is often um, more involved and a little more fraught than um, what you'll find reflected in a lot of um, resources out there. So almost all the time when you're like a real world NLP practitioner, you use pre-made stop word lists. Um, so this plot visualizes the set intersections for three common stop word lists in English in what is called an upset plot. So the lengths of the bars show on the on the side there show you the lengths of the lists and then the lengths up on the top part show you the lengths of the set intersections. So the lengths of the lists are quite different um, and notice they don't all contain the same sets of words. The important thing to remember about stop word lexicons is that they're not created in some neutral, perfect setting, but instead they are um, context specific and um, they can be um, biased um, in the way that almost all, um, you know, data sets uh, created from uh, can be biased. So, so both of these things are true because these lists are created from large data sets of language. So they create, they, re, they reflect the characteristics of the data used in their creation. So this is the list of those 10 words. See those, that little, those, that little bar that those 10 words that are in the smart lexicon, but not in the snowball lexicon. Notice they're all contractions, um, but that's not because the snowball lexicon doesn't include contractions. It has a lot of them. Um, also notice that he's, that that list has he's, but it doesn't have she's. Um, so this, this is an example of that, um, of that bias that occurs because these data sets, these lexicons are created from large data sets of text. So the, the lexicon creators look at, um, they, they take some big corpus of language. Um, they take the most frequent words in that big corpus of language and they make some cutoff and some decisions about what to include or exclude. And then you end up here, you know, because in that big corpus of language, you know, like men were discussed more often than women. So like so many decisions when it comes to modeling with language, like we as practitioners have to decide what is appropriate to the domain that we're working in at the end. And it turns out that's even true for picking a stop word list, you know, like something as that seems as um, 
non, um, you know, like not like not important, right? As picking a stop word list, but it, it turns out like it, it's it, we even see it in we even see it in 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 that um, uh, aspect of what it is that we're working on. Um, so uh, in tidy models, we implement a pre-processing step like this one by adding additional step to our recipe. Like we first we specified the variables we'll use, then we tokenize the text, and now we remove the stop words. So here this removes a default step because we're not passing in any option. Um, but you can, you know, use a non-default set, you can you can create a custom set, and that is certainly appropriate in many use cases. Um, this plot goes back to that model of um, the Supreme Court uh, opinions um, and shows, okay, let's say we take a model that has unigrams and um, we tried removing different sets of stop words. So, um, that and it show, this shows the the different lengths of the stop words and like how what kind of results do we get here so the snowball lexicon here contains the smallest number of words and in this case it results in the best performance so reviewing removing fewer stop words results in the best performance for this for this case so this specific result is not generalizable to all data sets and contexts, but the fact that removing different sets of stop words can have noticeably different effects on your model results, that is quite transferable. So the only way to know what is right is to try several options. And so this is back to this idea that um, machine learning is an empirical field and we need to know how to try different options in a way that we're not fooling ourselves um, and we and we're using good statistical practice to measure differences. All right, let's go to another pre-processing step. So um, when we deal with text, often documents contain different versions of one base word, often called a stem. So what if we aren't interested in the difference between animals and animal, and we want to treat both of those together? Um, so this idea is at the heart of what's called stemming. So there's no, you know, like one right or correct or accepted way to stem text. So this plot shows three approaches for stemming, starting from something people actually do, which is just remove final S, the final S, to some more complex rules. Um, the middle one is uh, a set of rules um, for handling plural endings that is called the S stemmer. Um, and then the one on the right is uh, probably the best known implementation of stemming uh, called the Porter algorithm. So you, we can see here that the Porter stemming is the most different from the other two approaches. Um, in the top 20 words that are shown here uh, from this data set of animal descriptions, um, we see how the word species was treated quite differently. Um, animal, um, predator, the kind of collection of words, live, living, life, lives, how, how those were all treated differently. So practitioners typically are um, interested in stemming text because it can bucket tokens together that belong together, like in the way that we understand it as um, <clears throat> like human users of language. So these are all um, what you would call stemming rules. And uh, you can think of them as like rules-based um, or algorithmic in nature, and they're very step-by-step. Step. Uh, the other way that this is done is via um, lemmatization. And you think of lemmatization as based on large dictionaries, um, and it incorporates um, linguistic understanding of what words belong together. And so instead of saying, um, okay, I will go step-by-step step through a set of rules about how to handle what this word is doing, instead you look up the word in a, um, in a big dictionary, um, and I understand then um, what words, wh how how should this word be um, uh, like limitized? What should it go together? So so with with either approach, um, with either approach that you have, it seems like oh that's probably going to be a helpful thing to do. Because when we work with text data, we have so many features um, 
so this here, I've got the that animal data set, and I um, I've transformed it to like a matrix representation, much like we would use in a model here. And so notice, um, it's a this is a very small like demo data set. It doesn't have that many documents in it, but it has got. 16,000, almost 17,000 features. And that, in this case, that means words. If I, if I did bigrams, it would be even more. It would be so many, so many features. And look at that sparsity, so high, 98% sparse. Like, think of that as the sparsity of the data that we want to use to build a supervised machine learning model. So if we stem the words, so this right here is like using um, the porter, uh, stemming, the number of the word features gets reduced. So this is before, this is after. It gets reduced by many thousands. So that seems like it's good, right? The sparsity didn't change that much, but it, it went down, you know. So common sense says like, oh, um, reducing the number of word features that dramatically, um, that should um, per, that should improve the performance of my machine learning model that we train with it. Uh, but that does assume that we haven't lost any important information by stemming. And um, the thing, so stemming can be helpful in some contexts, but the thing is that typical stemming algorithms are, so, are pretty um, aggressive, are pretty aggressive. They have been built to favor sensitivity or recall, or the true positive rate. And um, that is at the expense of the specificity or the precision or the true negative rate. So um, in, a, in a supervised machine learning context, this affects a, mo a model's um, positive predictive value, um, like its precision, or its ability to not incorrectly label true negatives as positive. I think I said that right. <laughs> All right, so like stemming can increase a model's ability to find the positive examples. So um, uh, like say, like the animal's descriptions associated with a certain diet in this example, we've kind of been um, saying. However, if the text is overstemmed, um, which is really easy to do with, t with stemming algorithms, and I, in my experience, even lemmatization, although less so with lemmatization, the resulting model loses its ability to label the negative examples. In this case, say like the, the descriptions not about that certain diet correctly. So that's definitely something to watch out for. <clears throat> so even basic pre-processing for text, like what is show, I'm showing here in this feature engineering recipe, um, like it can be pretty computationally expensive. Um, and the choices that a practitioner makes, like whether to remove stop words or to stem text can have a dramatic impact on how machine learning models um, perform. So what this means is that, um, uh, the prioritization that like we as practitioners give to like what are we learning about um what are we writing about um when we you know mentor people or teach like how do we talk about these kind of feature engineering for, uh, steps for text that contributes to um more robust statistical practices in our field I mentioned before the sparsity of text data and the sparsity of text data is one of the really defining characteristics of it. This is just because of how language works. Um, we use a few words a lot of times and a lot of words just a couple of times. And with a real set of natural language, you end up with relationships that look like this in terms of um, how the sparsity changes as you add more documents to, uh, you know, like a corpus that you're trying to study or model, and then, um, and then like the more unique words that you get. So we've got the sparsity over there, and then the like the amount of memory that it takes to um, to hold it, and you know, it just it just changes very fast. So this, it turns out, this is true. Like even if you use specialized data structures that are meant to store sparse data, you still end up growing the memory required to handle text data in a very non-linear way. So you, as you add more documents, the amount of memory required to hold it grows 
non-linearly with the amount of documents, even if you use like sparse matrices. This means it takes a while to train a model. <clears throat> and this mo has motivated a whole set of work around the idea of dense word embeddings. So linguists have worked for a long time on um, vector models for language that reduce the number of dimensions representing text data based on how people use language because we don't use those words randomly together. It's not it's not like um, it's not like uh, like, oh, yeah, just throw the words in the bag, you know, like bag of words and like it, that's not how we use language, right? Like there's we words are not independently used of each other so people have been thinking about this for a very long time this quote here actually dates back to 1957 um it's from a linguist who was thinking exactly about dense word vectors um so the idea here is that we use um statistical modeling uh, maybe just straightforward word counts plus matrix factorization, maybe a fancier math that involves neural networks to take this really high dimensional space and create a new lower dimensional space that is special because the new space is created based on vectors that incorporate information on which words are used together. And then we can use this new lower dimensional space to make you know everything go better, like make, make all the um, uh, all of our math easier and better. So you need a big data set of text to create or learn these word embeddings or word vectors. So um, this table I'm showing right here is from a um, a set of embeddings that I created using a corpus of complaints to the United States um, Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. So this is a like a United States government um, office, uh, government uh, organization, and um, uh, the cons like U.S. consumers can uh, file complaints about financial products. So this is things like credit cards, mortgages, student loans. People can say about like, oh, this company did this bad thing, um, and and they will, you know track it and like try to resolve it. So we've got this. So so everyone submitted all the stuff that went wrong with their financial products. We have this big data set of complaints, super high dimensional space. I created new and word embeddings for a lower dimensional space. And then in this new lower dimensional space, you can find words and say, where are uh, how close together are words um, and, and we can learn these relationships between how words are used together this with this space learns semantic meaning this uh, that's the idea of these of these spaces like ie you shall know a word by the company it keeps like we this these new um, lower dimensional spaces um, reflect how words are used together Okay, so in this new lower dimensional space that's about people's financial products and things that have gone wrong with them, um, we have the word month and the closest years are like, the closest words are year, months, monthly, installments, payment, week, weeks. So this is these are the words that people use similarly to each other when talking about um, uh, uh, things that have gone wrong in their, um, in their uh, financial products. Um, in the new space defined by these embeddings, um, the word error is closest to um, mistake, cler clerical mistakes, glitches, problems. Oh, there's a miscommunication. There's a misunderstanding, you know, about like their their bills. There's a discrepancy, you know, like these are these things um, uh, for this for this kind of um, the kind of text that people are saying when they say something has happened that is wrong with their um, with their their mortgage or their student loan or their credit card. So you don't have to create embeddings yourself, though. You can use word embeddings that are pre-trained 
um, so created by someone else who, who like based on some huge corpus of data that they have access to and you probably don't. So um, one of the most used ones is um, uh, are the glove embeddings. So glove embeddings are created um, on all of Wikipedia, all of the Google News data set and like like vast swaths of the Internet, basically. And they're created um, with like more sophisticated math. Like I made these with um, uh, word counts and matrix factorization, and these are made using um, uh, like uh, deep learning based uh, math. OK, so this table shows the results for the same word, but for these glove embeddings. So some of the closest words are um, are similar, but we no longer have some of that domain specific flavor like clerical discrepancy. Um, and now we have probability and calculation, which people were definitely not talking about when they were talking about their financial product complaints. So embeddings are um, trained or learned from like a large corpus of text data. So the characteristics of that corpus become part of the embeddings. So machine learning in general, you know, like is exquisite, like exquisitely sensitive to whatever is in your training data. And this is never more obvious than when dealing with text data. And like maybe word embeddings are just this like classic, classic example, right? And like, so if we can make our own, often they can be um, a better fit for our use case. Um, and whereas these general ones can be a little more um, uh, uh, neutral and or, um, you know, you know, like blandish, you know, like, like, because they don't have that like domain specific flavor. It also means that any human prejudice or bias in the corpus becomes imprinted into the embeddings. Um, so, in fact, when we look at some of the most commonly available embeddings, we find that um, African American first names um, are associated with more unpleasant feelings, like they are closer to the, um, you know, like the negative feelings than European American first names, like the names that in the US are used more by black versus white people. Um, women's first names are more associated with family and men's first names are associated more with career and terms associated with women like um, mother, aunt, grandmother, sister are more associated with the arts. They're like they're closer to the arts and terms the sort of flip side, the terms associated with men are more associated with science. So bias is so ingrained in word embeddings that they can be used to quantify change in social attitudes over time. Like people have actually done um, studies where they used that bias as something that they measure to measure like and then take like corpuses of language over time and then measured it like like it's like, oh, these things have this bias. Let's use the bias as something that we measure over time. It's like um, it's like imprinted into them. Word embeddings are um, a pretty exaggerated or extreme example. It turns out, though, that all of the feature engineering decisions that we make when it comes to text data have a big effect on our results. Um, uh, they they're not they're not um, uh, neutral or um, or or context free or or consequence free. They have impact on the results that we get, both in terms of model performance and in terms of how appropriate or how fair our models are. So um, as I wrap up here, when it comes to pre-processing your text data, creating these features, you have a lot of options and quite a bit of um, responsibility. So my advice is to always start with um, simpler models that you can understand quite deeply. Um, to adopt good statistical practices as you train and tune models so you aren't fooled about model performance that you would expect with various approaches. So you can be like if you change to more complex approaches that you you know how how much they actually improve. You aren't fooled into um, optimistic estimates of how much better they are. 
and that you use model explainability tools and frameworks so you can understand um, any less straightforward models that you use. So these are all things that my coworkers and I have written about and have shared about how to integrate into your modeling and uh, we'll, we will continue to do that. So with that, I will um, say thank you so much. I wanna be sure to thank um, my teammates on the Tidy Models team at our studio, as well as my co-author on um, our new book, um, Emil Wiedfeld. Julia, that was absolutely fantastic talk. Have you got time to stick around for a few questions? I do. Yes, I do. Okay, so I've got one for myself and then I'll go to two others. So what are the future plans in 2020 and beyond for Tidy Models development? So what kind of prioritization of new models, approaches, et cetera, are going to be built into the tool? Yes, let me. Um, so we did a... We did a um, recent survey where we asked people what they were most interested in, and I can I will actually drop into the chat the results of that. I'm I'm probably not going to publicize it until um, our our Q4 like wrap up that I, I usually do like a Q4 wrap up. I do every quarter I do like a blog post wrap up thing, but oh. let me draw, I'll drop that here. So if you people are interested in it. Um, no, so the great. thing, the things that people were, so these are the things that we kind of have like on, on, um, on the docket for next year. Um, so one thing I'm working on a ton is like um, ML ops or model ops, like deployment and monitoring. Um, so that's one thing that um, here I'll stop sharing so that stop share okay so one thing i'm working a ton on is um uh personally is um uh deployment and monitoring um but in terms of like uh but that's kind of already in process some new things that we're talking about starting up that we haven't really started yet um mm -hmm. are um like supervised feature selection so that would be like recipes but that uses the outcome to decide what features to include um can we make um, model fairness metrics more like there's several frameworks already for this in R, but can we make that be really fluent like with the tidy models framework like for like that you can use it really fluently in yardstick. And um, uh, another one uh, that I think is going to be really important for for the deployment side is better serialization tools for some things like um, like XGBoost. Keras, mm -hmm. some of these things that have better serialization, like it's like, oh, I trained this model, I need to do something with it later, like I need to save it. And um, like we like the, uh, these are some, these are some um, model types that have better options for how do we serialize them to then deploy them. And right now we're doing some pretty hacky stuff. And so getting that better. No, that's really great. Thanks for that insight. Uh, another question that's come in. This is quite a long question. To what extent do you work with non-technical subject matter experts, i.e. people who don't use R themselves, but are used to working with the data in other ways to understand the context of the data and inform pre-processing decisions? Asking as my experience uh, in this can be invaluable. Yes. So, so in my current job, I do this less, but in my previous jobs, I did this a lot. So now, now my job is like, hey, build tooling for our users. So now I mostly work with, now I mostly work with like our users, uh, people starting to use R, you yeah. know, things like that. But in my previous jobs, you know, like I've worked as like a data scientist in tech and in the nonprofit sector. Mm -hmm. And in both of those um, experiences, um, in those parts of my career, um, I found like, like um, Estelle says that, um, being able to explain um, what is happening to data, what the impact is, is um, super important for um, like business stakeholders or um, decision makers, you know, like I, I don't, you, maybe you don't think about like business stakeholders in the NHS, but like people who are decision makers, you know, or clinicians or um, uh, people having to take the output of a model and understand it. Mm -hmm. um, I think when it comes to, um, I, I think that, uh, some, some things that come to mind to this are like, do I want to tell someone, you know, like at this, in this context, I was like, Hey, yeah, I'm going to show them like these plots that have RMSE on the Y axis. And I think it's probably safe that I, it's reasonable. I'll say root mean squared error and 
is a model that predicted year. And most people, I, it's probably pretty safe for me to be say like, most people probably are going to get the gist at least of what I'm going to say, that, what I mean, you know? But if I was like, okay, it's time for me to explain, um, uh, hey, here's why I um, was not able to include any higher in order information with this model, you know? Um, and I could, I could say this, you know, like, um, with this model, if I tried, if I like, all we can do is single words with this model, because when I tried to include higher order information, instead of being able to predict, um, plus or minus 20 years, it went uh, to plus or minus 30 years. Like, mm. yes, I tried to include more information, but it actually made us be able to predict it worse. So we, we just can't include that higher order information, you know? So, um, so yes, it is, I, I think that that skill um, is, is table stakes for people working with data in organizations like it is it is a huge part of our work is how do we communicate about our results are we able to communicate it in appropriate ways for different kinds of audiences it is like it is part of the job it is part of the job no you're 100 percent right it's that data storytelling and the, you know the ability to use your technical skills to simplify completely agree one last question then so how much of the text analysis pipeline could be done preemptively, pre-baked rather than redone for each case? So I think that's like the case for recipes, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, so if you have um, the same training data, um, okay. So I think if this this person is asking, like, can you save? Like you can, can you can train? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's, this person is maybe asking, um, like, can we can text analysis reuse from other data sets? And so I'll I'll maybe reflect on that a little bit. And if this person wants to uh, retype or or uh, reframe their question, that is, I'm. Th well, I, is that very, what you're looking for? <laughs> that's very welcome, um, because. Um, um, this is something that people do where they where they say, hey, there's so much data, text data out in there within the world. Language, we start with, we start with um, like, why do we need to start from scratch every time? Like, mm -hmm. like, is it is it 80% or 90%? Can we get, uh, can we get there with just using, hey, people use language the same everywhere, you know? Mm -hmm. um, so, um, <clears throat> This depends. Um, a, this depends a lot on the like ha the context of your um, your data set. So, for example, people who try to do this with electronic health records have like it doesn't work at all. It doesn't work at all. You know, like they try to use these general purpose language models that are out there. You know, you can buy and pay for these like off the shelf mm. um, entity recognition models or sentiment analysis models or you know like various kinds of things from the big cloud providers and like people I talk to who try these kinds of things on say very specific kinds of text where people like very domain specific kinds of text it's like it does not work at all so think about text think about text data as like on a spectrum from all of the internet to like people writing electronic like clinicians writing their notes you know just as an example right and it's like where are you on that spectrum and 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 like off the shelf text models are built with enormous data sets enormous and so it's like bias variance trade off you know that's mm -hmm. where that's where we're at with this and so it's like where are you on that and that kind of tells you how able are you to use something that has been pre-trained mm -hmm. uh, there are models out there like transfer transfer learning models where you you take like one of the pre-trained models and then you kind of just sprinkle a little bit of your own data on the top just like a little bit and there's it, those are pretty um, impressive. Mm. Um, I, I haven't uh, worked on many or seen many implementations of this in R, um, but if you you know are someone who can work in Python, um, some of the uh, fast AI people have some uh, pretty easy to use implementations of this where you start say with like all of Wikipedia and, and then you like sprinkle not that many, like on the order of a thousand of your examples on the top. And then you, you so you, so picture yourself taking Wikipedia and then like shifting it over to your 
context, you know, with just mm -hmm. like a few. So anyway, I hope that gets at what that person is asking. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. It's those hugging face type models, those pre-trained zero shot type models that are kind of, you know, rapidly emerging in the perhaps Python space. So I've, I've started to utilize a few of those. But like you say, it'd be good to see in our implementation. So yeah, perhaps yeah, I agree. something to be, I don't know, yeah. looped into the tidy models pipeline eventually. No, Julia, that's absolutely great. Fantastic. I'm getting some really positive feedback around your talk. So thanks for sparing your time today. And it's been really, really cool listening to you. I've, I've had a few fanboy moments, I've got to say, Julia. <laughs> thank you. Well, thank you so much for having me and for the really great questions. And I'm really happy to have been here and be able to talk to you all. Yeah, happy to stick around if you want to, like you say, go into the background. I think Chris Beely, our chair, co-chair, is going to uh, probably close off the session. But thanks for your talk today, Julia. It's been great. Thank you so much. Thanks. See you soon. Bye. So, Chris, over to Hello. you. Hello. Yes, sorry. Here I am. Uh, I'll just uh, share my screen. Uh, I don't know how I can possibly follow that, really, to be honest. I've been dreading this all week, but never mind. It's me, and it's just tough luck, basically. Um. Just trying to find the right thing. I think that's probably my screen showing. Um, OK, so I just want to give a few closing remarks, really, just to uh, kind of uh, rouse the troops a bit and uh, do the uh, relevant bits of kind of admin and reminders. Um, so I just want to just mention, you know, just to reflect on how far we've come, really. So I remember, uh, I believe it formally launched in March 2018, NHSR. Um, and I remember first hearing about it and you know not really knowing anything about it because uh, it was so new and it was so small back then as well but suddenly feeling like I wasn't alone I'd been learning I've been using R completely on my own since I think about 2010 uh, and it was a, quite a miserable experience really apart from the brilliance of R um, and the first conference was tiny uh, but completely brilliant that was in November of 2018 um, and you know we've gone from strength to strength I did think that we couldn't possibly top last year's conference but I think we definitely have I think that's true in terms of the the, the variety of people we, we've got from outside of the community coming um but also from the strength of the actual community uh you know the the, the community uh, submissions was, was so amazing this year um and I'm unambiguously proud of NHSR it's one it's what I'm a member of lots of things that I sort of love and have you know differences with but that's not true of NHSR NHSR absolutely reflects my core values 100% um so I'd say the core values of NHSR according to me are it's pretty much just a flat hierarchy it's just people just get on and just do things uh, there's no need for a lot of decision making really uh we share obviously that's that's the number one I think really we cooperate against organizational boundaries people have talked about doing that for years but we've just got on and done it we cooperate across international boundaries even we just we cooperate that's that's that, that's what we do um one thing that i really love about nhsr is that we absolutely love beginners there's someone in the slack today saying they they, they can't get it on their computer and that's the, that's the kind of person that we love more than anything else in the community is someone who's absolutely just starting out and the other thing that we do is we make mistakes and we learn together so zoe yeah, scooped me on this slightly yesterday but a really good example of that i think is that um We'd been doing some podcasts, as Mohammed mentioned, and I sat, I think, five or six people down a little while ago and did a conference and deleted half of it by accident and fluffed it. So I think that's a really good example of, of, of learning together. And uh, everyone was very kind about it. And we're going to we're going to have it. We're going to uh, do it again. Um, so, yeah, so NHSR basically, I think, is all about this idea that, our cult, there, you know, like, where is all this stuff written down? Where's the strategy? Where's the, I don't know. Well, maybe it is. I don't know, but I haven't seen it. Um, it's, I think our practice is embedded in our culture. And I think we value, uh, it's a bit like agile tech world. I think we value basically doing over talking. I read so many like policy papers and, you know, things and they're great, you know, and I, I refer to them often. Um, but I do feel like I read quite a lot of it. And I just think, yeah, we did that last year, you know, so yeah, that's, that's really great. Um, NHSR for me basically is partly about permission. If you've got permission from your manager to be involved in the community, then you've got permission to do all the stuff we're talking about, to share, to cooperate, all that kind of stuff. I, no, I don't think I've ever really seen a project that I truly love, certainly true of my projects, that anyone has asked for. Nobody asks for the best stuff. There's no funding, there's no managers asking for it, there's no nothing. Just some group of people just randomly get together and just do something. And a great example of that NHSR plot the dots. Um, and again, so this is this is another mayor culpa from me. So we talked about that for a long time and I sort of I mean, I didn't say, oh, don't do it at all, but I didn't recommend prioritizing it. Um, 
And I was totally wrong. So that's a good example of someone in a room sitting thinking they know best. Um, and I was saying, well, I don't know, is it that important for the community? I'm not really sure if it is. Chris mainly, uh, to his great credit, reminded me that I'd said that. Uh, and I was completely wrong. And they did it. And oh, it's brilliant. And I've used it myself. Um, so, yeah, so we already know what to build. We already know what we should be learning. We know the stuff. That's that's the message, isn't it? And to be to their great credit, we've heard that um, from the speakers. We heard it from Suki. We heard it from um, Sarah Culkin. Uh, and we heard it from Peter Spilsbury. And that, I think that's the message. And we, we embody that message. Uh, and the classic thing, of course, is uh, computers. Um, often it's the computer department that says no. And, that, you know, if we can't use this tech at all, then we can't do anything. Um, right, I don't want to take up too much time. Just to, I just wanted to just very quickly just so I think the magic source of it basically is how do you, you know, how do you replicate the success? Uh, I think it's partly that we began with the senior fellows. Um, and I think the senior fellows, it was values based recruitment, basically. Uh, and it was very broad based. Um, so we had people, we had stats people, we had machine learning people, we had academics, we had people who are interested in teaching and learning. Open source, that's obviously me. I'm the designated person that harangues people about open source, and I'm very happy to do that. Um, and it's, uh, you know, once you've got that in place and you've got that kind of, I wouldn't call it leadership in the formal sense, but once you've got those kind of senior figures, uh, the, the rest kind of follows from the community. Um, so what's next for us? Uh, as I said in my talk yesterday, everyone is getting far too good. Uh, you know, a couple of years ago, my talk, I think, would have been very original. I'm going to say, oh, this is very clever, isn't it? But really, I feel like I'm being left behind by the community slightly now, which is amazing. Um, so I'm starting to, and I said this in the third podcast, actually, I'm starting to actually tell the world, we, I don't want us to, to start doing other things. I want other people to be more like us. I want people to start doing things instead of talking about doing them. And I want uh, I want to mainstream our values. I want to mainstream our values, uh, you know, throughout analytics in the NHS. And I think we're really starting to see that, which is great. I want to see truly uh, open, anarchic, spontaneous collaboration. Uh, I think that's still very rare for all the great stuff that's going on with sharing. That kind of spontaneous collaboration gave us Linux, which gave us the Internet. Um, so and, you know, I think that's that's the next step for us. Um, and also a, a, a big problem for us that, that we can solve with some of the big brains in this organization is how can we build, and we've heard a lot of this, a lot of people talking about this, but it, it's very difficult. How can we build solutions that can actually be shared at scale? How do you do that? Um, so text mining and patient experience, I've done some work with that. I think that could be generalized, but I've, you know, it, it's, a, it's a hard problem. Um, there's some work going on in DHSE, which I'm also trying to get involved with, looking at text analysis of consultation data which I think is also another generic problem. And a thing that I just put in at the last minute today from Adam Watkins' presentation earlier with the mapping thing. I think that's another thing. That's a really, really generic problem that we can all get our teeth into. So I think that's what we want to do. And again, it's just, I, well, who knows? I don't think a manager dropped out of the sky and asked for that. I don't think, uh, I think it's just, you know, talented people with imaginations just started doing it. Um, okay, I said this in the talk before and I haven't got a lot of time, so I'm not going to say it again. Um, right, and we've been talking on them about on Twitter all day, so I'm going to say it now out loud, uh, but it's already on the Twitter. So we'd like you to get involved um, with the community if you're not already. So you please join the Slack uh, and do more for us. You could write a blog for us. You could come on the podcast. You can become a champion or a fellow. You can come to the book group. You can run training. You can contribute training. You can contribute code. Um, so we're looking for pledges, basically. So please go on Twitter or Zoom or blog or whatever and just talk about what you're going to do. Uh, so here's mine. So I'm going to carry on helping on Slack, as I mentioned earlier. To be honest, if you ask me a question about R and I'm bored, I will almost certainly switch immediately to the to the R question because I'm quite easily distracted. Uh, I'll continue to do the podcast with help from the awesome Tom Gemma, and I promise I won't uh, bin any of the more data by accident. I'm going to run another shiny workshop next year. I believe you know they, they, all the workshops just go immediately, so we, we can never run enough. So I'll run another one and and the conference one next year. Uh, I'm sure I'll contribute something on the GitHub. I don't know if it'll be code or not. I don't know, but I'll be do something. I'll talk or do issues or test or something. And I will just carry on talking to people about how brilliant we are. And I will also do what seems to become my job, which is talk to random people all over the country about Shiny and production. I talk to people all over the country all the time about that. So if you're interested in that, uh, please uh, come and find me because I, I do do that quite a lot. Um, Yes, final housekeeping messages. The advanced style workshops are now open for booking. I don't have a link on here, which is kind of dumb, isn't it? Maybe someone will put it in the Zoom for me or tweet it. Uh, I fear many of them are already gone, to be honest, because they were announced a little while ago. I'm very sorry about that. We might try and look at the numbers again if we can. It's very difficult to uh, to 
provide as much as can be done, which I think just, you know, shows how successful we're being. It's a good problem to have. Uh, get involved, run one. My shiny one is open source. Just go for it. Just pick it up, run it. If you want to ask me a few questions about it, please do. Um, and that's it. That's all I want to say. So I just want to, I want to close out by thanking everybody. I want to thank the NHSR core team who I know have been, it's horror. I mean, even just being a, my level of involvement is a very stressful and a lot of work. So I'm sure they've, you know, put in 10 or 20 times more than that. So thank you very much to the uh, NHSR core team without whom this would not be possible. Uh, I want to thank all the speakers and we've had speakers from all over the world, which I think is amazing. So thank you, whatever time zone you've been in or whatever. It's marvelous to hear from you and see you. It's fantastic. To all our partners listed, I think we've got all the partners on here. This is a relatively new slide, so thank you to all of them. And thank you to all of you, everyone who came, everyone in the community, everyone who listened, everyone asked questions, everyone who joined the Slack. It's a fantastic, wonderful thing of which I'm truly proud. And so uh, I would like to, to thank you all very much for being part of it. I suspect, long experience tells me that Mohammed is going to jump out of the shadows now and say something. Or maybe not, maybe Thank you, and and, oh, and uh, everybody can uh, can sign off freely. Thank you, everybody, uh, and we look forward to your uh, involvement in, in the future. Have a great evening or a great day wherever you are, and a good and a great thank you to Julia for hanging on as well. Bye, bye, everyone. Bye. Have a great afternoon. Thanks, everyone.